Am I muted this whole dang time? My gosh! I have been muted. Oh my gosh. I am a fellow prophet. Just like Jesus. Mm. The fact that I didn't know that I was muted this whole time. That tells you that all of the words and prophecies that I've been performing here on Myth Vision... They can't be truly from God. If, if so, then how the heck could I get this wrong? How could I get this wrong? All right, what I said in a nutshell is C.S. Lewis said Jesus was wrong. I'm going to make this quick. Jesus was wrong about when he was going to come back, when the end was going to happen. He was ignorant. He was a fallible human, but God in the flesh at the same time somehow in his theology, and he just couldn't understand it. As a Christian scholar, he just couldn't understand it. And C.S. Lewis is right. Jesus was wrong. Now, as a Christian, I have to play myself back. I didn't want that to be true. Jesus couldn't be wrong. I was reprimanded. I got in trouble with the Presbyterian church, sat in front of five elders, and was rebuked and wasn't allowed to respond. Felt like Martin Luther, the scene where Martin Luther says, I cannot recant. My conscience and scripture tells me so. That's how I felt when I stood in front of those five elders at the Presbyterian Church, when they told me, stop teaching that Jesus did come back, that the end did happen, because that's not true. And they're kind of right. But damn it, doesn't that destroy everything Jesus said? It does. And I was saying earlier, when you guys couldn't read my mind or my lips, that Jesus is either wrong or God cannot speak our language. Literally, if you want to say God has inspired the text, they were not speaking coherently at all. And every word that they said makes no sense. So don't try to interpret the text at all. Give up while you're ahead. Don't even try it. And we're going to go into the Bible today. We're going to get into the text. We're going to open the pericope. We're going to get into each example. And I want those who are watching, who are honest... And I'm going to say something about honesty because I think cognitive dissonance and I think our bias gets in the way and it causes us from going to conclusions that may be true. If you're honest, you will follow what the text is actually trying to say. That means you got to believe it. If the text says that people believe Jesus rose from the dead, I have no reason to believe or no reason not to believe that people believe Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. I don't have to deny that. That doesn't mean I believe Jesus actually did rise from the dead, but I want to accurately see what the text says, then draw conclusions. And if the text says that the end was going to happen soon, that Paul thought within his own lifetime, that Jesus was saying this generation, and of course, goodness gracious, can you, you can run off with interpretations with these terms in Greek, but we're going to get into that. Now, everybody who's tuning in can actually hear me. You know, I'm kind of wondering if I was a deaf uh, I was someone who's a mute, actually. And then all of a sudden, a miracle happened in the midst of this, and now you can hear me. My lips were moving, but the words just weren't coming out. So I was showing Bart Ehrman, because I want you to get the early bird special. Go sign up. It does help Myth Vision. I do get a commission. For everybody who signs up, I get a commission. It helps Myth Vision out. I will be there as well. 
the unknown gospels. Why did he title it this? Because so many people are reading these as one story and they aren't really knowing what each gospel is trying to say. They are not talking about a single message and it's all identical. Each author has their own goal, intention, theology, etc., contradicting each other the whole nine yards. That's what the scholarship is pointing towards. And of course, I'm continuing down that path. I was just starting over his um, How Jesus Became God on Audible. He has a lecture series that he's doing, and I can't remember if it's uh, The Great Courses, I think it is. Man, Bart is phenomenal going into the categories of angels and sons of God and demigods and gods that were powers beside the supreme God and all of this stuff going down into Greco-Roman and Jewish culture to Jesus. And what do we have? We have an evolution taking place even with Jesus. So sign up. It's early bird special now, and it's going to be live so you can get your questions asked. And it's supposed to go deeper than the other courses as well. Uh, I will be there. I'm excited. Also, join the Patreon because the end is nigh. And not because Jesus said so, because I'm saying so. And you don't want to get left behind, right? Nobody wants to get left behind. So you can get protected and be sucked up in outer space in the UFO ship that I have created ages ago toward the beginning of creation. And you'll you'll be fine. You know what I mean? Just join. It's all good. You get early access to everything. You can harass the hell out of me. You can like ask me, hey, what about this scholar? I've had so many Patreon members recommend scholars I didn't even know that I've interviewed that you've seen publicly and didn't even know. Well, Derek must have just found that scholar. No. People brought that scholar to my attention. So I listen to those who are uh, supporters of what I do. I mentioned before I was completely deaf that for those who are paint mythicist, I am a painting my houses. Okay. So I missed that when I got in the shower before the live. <sighs> Goodness gracious. Can't believe. I can't believe I was muted that whole time. Mm -mm 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 -mm. All right. I got to get my, just my camera here. We're going into the text here in just a second. I did put the link for those who are watching this later, maybe not during this live, who want to open this and read it for themselves. And I'm going to go into this and explain what's going on in this link and why I became a heretic to, to Christians. But let's go ahead and stop this music because because it's like, man, it's been anticipating for a while. I want to say hey to everybody in the chat. No Christian will admit to it. I wouldn't admit to it. I don't blame them. I do not, Bernard, I want everybody in the chat, while you're going to jump on the bandwagon and go, ha, 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 yeah, Jesus was wrong. I agree, he was wrong. And no Christian would want to admit it. I'm not going to say there aren't some that will say, okay, well, in Jesus' humanity, he didn't know because there's this hypostatic union that the church has developed over time, which is not, um, it, it's a concept created to try and explain what they're finding in their scripture, but it isn't something the scripture says. It's something that they've created to say Jesus is 100% man. Oh, he's 100% God equal with Yahweh uh, or even Yahweh himself, things like that. And they're trying to wrestle with this problem. Like not even the son of man who they think is Jesus knows the day or the hour. Holy crap. The heck is going on here? C.S. Lewis admitted it, but I wouldn't admit it when I was a Christian. So when I read the New Testament, these time statements we're going to get into today I was sold that Jesus was absolutely right and he did return. I had to do some shuffling of definitions to make that return happen in a way, not the way everyone expects the end to happen. That way Jesus didn't fail. And this is what's called preterism or preterism. It's the idea that something is fulfilled in the past, a past fulfillment. Most Christians are... Some form, they don't like the term probably, of a preterist, preterist. They believe Jesus fulfilled some Bible prophecy by his coming, a virgin birth. Oh, that's a prophecy he fulfills in their mind somehow. And I know when I believed how that was. We'll read this in Isaiah 14 and boom or whatever. But this whole notion of fulfillment, every Christian to some degree has that. And then there are those who go pretty far called partial preterist, and they're pretty much partial preterist because they think Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
John hints it, but doesn't really dwell on it much. Luke even downplays it, the apocalypse. But it's all that synoptic focus on the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And so they see these words as fulfilled. And there's some truth to this because it's written, I believe it's written, after the fact. And um, this is something that most academics like Bart Ehrman and you name it, people I usually interview, even the non Christian or the Christian scholars like Dale Allison Jr., who are on the more critical side, they're like, yeah, without a doubt, this seems like he's clearly aware of the war. He knows what happened in 70 AD and he's writing in reaction to the war. Whatever that reaction is, scholars have debates over this. Anywho, I just, I'm trying to make, make up for looking like an idiot in the first three minutes of complete silence while a hundred and something people watched me. <laughs> Scott Daniel, uh, I might bring on guests as the show goes on and allow people to come on and rebuke me in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, because they're just going to be they're like, you're wrong, Derek. You're, you're like Antichrist or like spirits, demons have got you under control and all that good stuff. What's up, Jason Sobek? Smack dab said silly, silly, silly. See truth. Dude, you just tried to call me, man. In fact, if it weren't for you. I wouldn't have known I was mute. You're an angel, a literal angel. In fact, you have literal wings. You probably don't even defecate. That's how sacred you are. All right, Quest Builds. Hello, first stream I've watched. I saw you through Professor Dave Explains. Well, welcome, Quest. Sorry you had to see me look like a doofus for a minute there. <laughs> look, I'm going to have to scroll through all these mutes. Hit that like button. On a scale from 1 to 10, how dumb did I look talking as long as I did? Once I get to you, I'll see all your numbers. One, well, you didn't look too dumb. Five is like, Derek, I want to say a 10 because you looked really, really dumb. But I like you, so I'm going to just say a 5. And like a 10 is just like, dude, you look pretty dumb. Okay? Let's just call it like it is. And I'm not going to be offended. Okay? I promise. All right? <laughs> Bart Ehrman. Yeah, I love Bart. I'm going back through, like I said, his lectures are phenomenal. Your mic is muted. I'm going to scroll down. Jesus didn't want us to hear it. That's at least someone is recognizing the problem here, right? Like we're solving the issue with my muteness. Like we realize there's another explanation, right? We can't just accept I'm an idiot. I, I appreciate those who follow who are my disciples out there who are going to reinterpret what actually happened at the beginning of this episode. Cause that's what I really meant. Like I knew that Jesus wouldn't want us to, you know, be heard here. So that's what's happening. You're going to have to say it all again. Your mic isn't working, Derek. <laughs> Dude, how far does this go? Oh man, Scott's even willing to throw some money out about this. All right, Scott, put some money down, man. You're muted. Here's two dollars to fix it. I think it did start to fix the problem here. Look, <laughs> the silence that says a lot. Okay, I feel you. I feel you. Okay, we're getting there. I'm trying to <sighs> lies. You caught me. You caught me. Okay, intro music. Am I getting there? Jesus was wrong, of course, as he will not come back and did not come back. That's a fact. Poor B.S. Lewis. Okay, hold up. Where am I at now? Where am I at? Did I finally catch up to where we are talking now? Derelict mute vision. Oh my gosh, you guys started having fun without me. All right, Humanist Reformation. I'm just going to take this super chat. We're going to roll into this because I've got some pericope I want to get into. What happened to the Christian that was going to debate on this subject? Did they finally read their Bible and decide that Jesus lied? Christian that was going to debate on this subject. Well, I hope to have Christians come on to have this discussion or debate, whatever, on the channel. Um, you know, I found the the whole like try to cop out out of this issue really a problem and it looks silly and i appreciate those who are christians and who call themselves christians like delcy allison jr and others who are honest about it even c.s lewis 
is trying to admit, like, as much as he doesn't want it to be the case, Jesus was wrong about this, okay? And in my mind, like, common sense tells me if you do a study of cognitive dissonance, you'll see this stuff happens. Like, failed apocalypse, every doomsday cult ends up making predictions and then either puts a new date out, reinterprets it, or comes up with a fulfilled concept that's always, well, unfalsifiable. You know, good. Jesus was behind that cloud over there. And, uh, you know, he did come to earth, uh, with, in an invisible form, like great, you know, uh, that helps us a lot. And we look around in Ukraine and Russia and the whole world's in chaos. It's like, Hmm. Yeah. The kingdom of God is here on earth. All right. And it's, it's amazing. Um, there's a lot of problems that I see. And if that cognitive dissonance study, I was talking to my buddy, uh, Matthew Hart, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. He debated the other night another Christian. If we take that cognitive dissonance study and lead it into the resurrection and what happened when Jesus died, like movements where leaders die, do the movements die out? Not always. In fact, that was the claim of Acts when they said Theodos, you know, is uh, the Jewish uh, teacher Gamaliel was trying to say, look, men, brethren, brethren, leave these men alone. You know, you might be fighting against God. There was a man, Theodos, led people out into the wilderness and then he died and his movement died. And if this movement's of God, you might be fighting against God. But if it's not, it'll die out, which is a hint for, from Acts to me saying, since this is written later and Christianity's growing, they're winking, saying it hasn't died out. Therefore, God. And that to me implies because this movement is still going, they this is evidence to the author and to the Christian readers. Well, duh, only God would have kept this movement going, especially since Jesus died. Therefore, Jesus must have rose again from the dead. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance stuff. Even rereading Delcy Allison's book on the resurrection, he says in one of his passages, I called him on the phone yesterday to talk with him a little. He says the cognitive dissonance route is the best route that you can take in terms of like the whole resurrection theme in his opinion on the new testament and what happens with christians still believing in jesus and believing he rose again from the dead if you're not going to believe he rose meaning i.e i'm a christian i believe jesus actually rose the cognitive dissonance route to him makes the best argument and i don't think enough studies are done on this but i think we could do more thank you for that super chat Okay, let me get down here. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Okay, wow, there's a lot of people. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Hit the like button. Mr. Monster, I love the response to your question about the empty tomb, and I also have to conclude that it has to be a fabricated story, story later down on the line. I don't know if it is, and I'm totally okay if it isn't. And if it is, it doesn't matter either way. Empty tomb or not does not say Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, there are other explanations uh, that to me, the last thing I would draw a conclusion on is saying this literally happened. That's the last position that I personally would draw. Uh, but it tell, that tells you a bit of my epistemology and it also tells you my skepticism. Um, I also don't think that, you know, Romulus and uh, Remus or... Uh, See, or Alexander the Great or Caesar Augustus or you name it, you know, had literal portents about their birth and were performing miracles and all this kind of stuff. Like, I, I don't buy that either. Um, I think people believe in things because people believe in strange things. Humans have that kind of thing built into them. But I do appreciate his response. I'm not so sure that I draw the conclusions, even on his understanding of resurrection, that Jesus was buried and raised I love Dominic Crossan, John Dominic Crossan, Dom, but I'm not so sure. Uh, I think Dom sometimes, how do I put this nicely? And I love him. Trust me. I think Dom sometimes wants to um, apply his modern activism into his interpretation. I think maybe of the text, the, the verb there in that to be raised or that raised, I think in Paul in first Corinthians 15 is just like waking someone up. They were asleep and you wake them up. And of course, we know in Jewish thought, like if someone was asleep, they'd be dead. Like it was common to call someone who was dead asleep because they would be awakened in the last day. 
which gets into the whole resurrection thing. Why did this only one guy rise and not the general resurrection of the dead, right? Why did that, why did it happen that way? And why did Matthew, the only gospel that does this, say that the saints rose from the dead? We have the zombie, you know, people call it the zombie apocalypse. Why is that gospel saying that? Are they trying to affirm general resurrection? Are they trying to make an attempt, realizing there's a problem here? I think so. Thank you, Mr. Monster. Inquisitive mind, just saw your Robert Hoyland interview on Mecca. Who is this ghost of myth vision? Only the ghost of myth vision knows who he is. That's all. Only the higher initiates would understand these these uh, mysteries that I'm laying before you today was preparing for preparing us for the apophatic vision of the one like Plotinus of old. Plotinus. Plotinus. Am I even saying that right? Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Smack dab. Um, where are we at? From Bulgaria. Double down on the lie. Yep. Sad. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. It happens. I think we all have that kind of tendency, right? When you believe or you're, or it's your mom or your dad or your sibling or someone you love, or your spouse, whatever it might be, whoever it might be, like you want to defend them even if they're wrong. Even if they're wrong, you want to try and defend them. So he who does not understand your silence will probably not understand your words. Albert Hubbard. Thank you, Jay Schroeder. Thank you. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Love your show, Derek. Thanks for everything. Humanist Reformation. Holy smokes. Thank you for dropping the 50 bomb. You're going to get wings and end up in a mansion in the uh, afterlife here. Don't worry. I got you. A real God, son of God, prophet or word of God or Allah or whatever. Get their words right the very first time every time. You don't need to read Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22 to know that all you need is a mustard seed of common sense. Mm. There are so many issues that I find that I wasn't able to accept as a Christian. And I'm not saying all Christians are like this. There are Christians that I admire and look at and go, how the heck are you a Christian? I don't understand why you need to be one. With 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 what you believe in, the, the, you're such a great human being. Why do you need this? And um, I don't know. And some of them are even going so far as to say they're failed. Like Jesus failed on the predictions here. But I believe he rose from the dead or, or they have faith in it. And I don't know why. Maybe it's because we have traditions and they like the tradition and it somehow gives them foundation. And I don't know. I don't, I don't live with that existential crisis. Like I got to believe in something or like there's nothing. I have nothing. And, and, and I'm kind of like scratching my head about my existence and what's it all about. And I don't, I don't have that. I have purpose, inherent purpose. So I, I definitely think that uh, if I would have known this a long time ago, I wouldn't have been a Christian. But I took the words of Jesus pretty strongly. Doc, what's up in the house? Melody Joy, I'm living proof. How do I support? Oh, I'm living abroad. Sorry. How do I support? Join the Patreon. Join the membership. If you want early access to everything, join the Patreon. I've got... I'm not exaggerating, everybody. This is a fact. Hundreds of videos that have not made it to YouTube light on the Patreon. You just got to hit uh, load more when you get to the bottom of the page. And you just and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And I'm always dropping new stuff. Plus, you can private message me. So if you're wanting to support the channel, you can also super chat. Uh, did I catch up to everybody? I don't want to leave anybody out. All right, we caught up. I think we caught up. Yes, I do. I, I have fun with Christmas but my kids mainly see it as like Santa Claus stuff. So it's like daddy brings in presents. All my kids know though, Santa's not real now, which I'm glad because I'm tired of giving credit to some, you know, fat guy with a beard who isn't me. I'm the one who worked for these gifts to give you kids. Be happy and proud of your dad for doing this. You know, not some guy who doesn't exist. Anyway, um, welcome everybody. Let's get into this. Let's get into this. Preterist 101. Preterism 101. Okay. This guy right here, David Green, I, I have talked to these people for, I'd say, 
over 10 years now, I've been at least acquainted, familiar with this group, a uh, theological group online called Full Preterist. And I've actually had conversations with David Green in private chat. I've created many Facebook groups back in the day about preterism. And ultimately, it's this way of defending prophecy in the Bible. Partial preterism says some of it's fulfilled and they only expect a few things to happen. R.C. Sproul, Gary Damar, Kenneth Gentry, reformed like scholars mainly are the ones who are trying to say that most things are fulfilled except like the final resurrection and the final judgment. That's all they're waiting for. Everything else is fulfilled. Um, I was one of those in the reformed camp when I went to the Presbyterian church for a couple of years. And then I found a scholar slash Christian theologian type named Don K. Preston who taught Jesus the second coming happened in the first century. And I'm like, what? No, it didn't. Like, all of my concepts about the second coming of Jesus were about to be thrown out the window because I was going to look at the New Testament, see a serious problem, and have to say either Jesus lied or he told the truth. You don't have a choice here. He either lied or, or I guess you could say he got it wrong, right? Which means he didn't tell the truth, which may not be an outright purposeful lie, but he got it wrong, which means he is obviously uh, fallible and just, I don't know why we would make someone like that who's fallible into our supreme being and deity who rose again from the dead. If he got it wrong, who's to say his followers didn't get things wrong? Who's to say, like, where do you stop? I mean, the, the domino effect. So I got kicked out real quick, my ugly mug again. I got kicked out of rooms I created, not because... Uh, they had power over me, but when I started changing views from partial preterism to full preterism, there's so much turmoil in the Christian community that they cannibalize themselves. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in atheist communities and stuff too, but it happened in the Christian community. And I became a heretic because I wanted to go with the Bible. And I got condemned with that passage where it's like to and fro with the wind uh, all the doctrines, like you're always going with a new doctrine, you're finding a new thing and you're going with it. And that's because I was seriously on a journey and I still am. What is the historical reality? What are the facts? And that's always been my goal. And while my friend who was born and raised in the Southern Baptist community who goes to the same church for 30 years is thrown out to and fro with the wind, you're always going about with doctrines. I'm thinking to myself, dude, you you were born in a bubble you think is true and have never tried to pop it to see if it isn't. You literally don't even know like, if you're right or wrong. You just believe you're right because your dad or your mom raised you in this community. You've never actually examined this stuff to go out and explore and test what you're looking at. So as a Christian, I, I had presuppositions. We all do. My presupposition was Jesus is God in the flesh. I had that one. Some Christians don't even have that one. But nonetheless, he would be right. And scripture was God breathed. So the Bible, as a Protestant, that's where I started. I wasn't going beyond that, trying to like see it was false at the time or see if there's any issues with the Bible. I let the Bible speak. And so I followed that, which led me to think when Jesus says some of these words, did he lie? They're like, what the heck? Why didn't this happen? It had to happen because Jesus is right. Let every man be a liar. And all my pastors in the Presbyterian church, everyone else, they were full of it in comparison to God's word. That was my approach. And that got me into so much trouble, not only in the Presbyterian church, that I had legal documentations mailed to me saying you are excommunicated from the PCA reformed church, but also on these Facebook groups. I was no longer welcomed. They didn't want to talk with me. They wanted to just tell me how wrong I was and that I'm a heretic now. And I mean, some of these groups, when you get into full preterism, right? These people are heretics compared to like orthodoxy in any way. And they were calling me a heretic. So like when you become the heretics heretic, that's a badge of honor. Because you're really just trying to figure it out no matter what anyone thinks about you. 
And if you're that kind of person, I commend you. And I want you to pat yourself on the back and say, you know what? I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep studying. I'm going to keep learning no matter where you are. But if you're a complacent person who, as uh, Dr. Price has said in the past, is a pew potato, goes into church, sits down and just, oh, la, 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 la. don't go around telling other people who are trying to seriously seek this stuff like you think you know, just because your pastor said, do some serious exploration before you want to go around and do that. So I've, I've lost a few Facebook groups over the years because I handed them over. I said, you know what? You're right. I don't even think like you guys anymore. Here, you guys can run it. I'd give the room up. I'd move on to a new thing. Well, I finally started Myth Vision and I created a Facebook group for Myth Vision. It's a private community in case you want to go there. It is safe. I have a public one and I have a private one. You can talk all the crap you want in the private one without having to worry about loved ones and people connected to you talking. Anywho, real quick, tell your kids, Captain Kerfuffle bought some of their gifts. <laughs> Captain, thank you. I will let them know. They are in the West Coast waiting for daddy to get there. I really do appreciate it. Okay, let's just dive into some of these texts. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to like spend too much time. I'm going to read some of these and David Green says this. Following this brief article are 101 biblical preterist time indicators, hence the title. There are many more than 101 to be found in scripture. I think that he's on to something with that. These are some explicit ones. But there's implications in some of the language throughout the New Testament about this apocalyptic end and the new, the nearness and whatnot. Schweitzer goes into this stuff throughout time. Strauss did this as well while destroying the harmonizers, you know. And there's of course Delcy Allison Jr. the his, the historical Christ, uh, the I'm sorry, the historical yeah the historical Christ and theological Jesus. And of course he goes into the whole failed apocalypse. Bart Ehrman, all of these scholars go into this stuff. So he says, if we were to con conclude or include every time indicator in scripture, the number would possibly be in the hundreds. My purpose is displaying these passages with some cross references is to lay out in a concise, easy to read format, the overwhelming testimony that our Lord, now mind you, David is a Christian. I used to be in the same circles as him, actually fulfilled the law and the prophets as he said he would, Matthew 5, 17. Now it seems to me that there are only two ways to get around these 101 scriptures and remain a futurist. So a futurist is someone who believes that Jesus will come in the future. They're waiting for the second coming. They're waiting for the resurrection. They're waiting for the final judgment. Why? Because it hasn't happened yet. One of those ways is to dismiss the spirit of imminence that saturates the New Testament and to say that it only indicates things that are soon in God's sight. How often do you have Christians say, God's time is different than your time, because they read 2 Peter 3. A day to the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So like, don't measure our time and how soon it's going to happen to God's. And you know what's interesting? Even Eusebius didn't think Peter wrote 2 Peter. Eusebius church father was like, eh, yeah, nah, nah, this nah, this doesn't look like Peter. And when you read it, it's clear they're trying to fix a problem. Because Jesus and the apostles, the original fathers, the apostles of the faith, claimed it was going to happen soon. And 2 Peter says, you know, uh, there are those mockers and scoffers in the last days mocking and scoffing, saying, when is this coming? Where, where is it at? All things have remained the same since the beginning. Nothing's happened. And of course, he wants to rebuke that and say, look, God's time is different than yours. There are some major problems with that approach. If the imminence saturating the New Testament was only an in God's sight imminence, then why was the Old Testament not also saturated with an in God's sight imminence? Why did God not tell Adam and Eve the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Because Shoot, this is a good point. He could have said that from the beginning, and it could have been thousands, 10,000 years into the future. And he could have said it was happening soon, but the word soon must not really mean soon. When God's time, is it your time? So God's tricking you. The language of the New Testament is tricking you. Yeah, that's right. We're still waiting for it because, well, soon doesn't really mean soon, and near doesn't mean near, and I'm coming quickly doesn't mean quickly. It just means really fast, like a lightning bolt when I decide I'm going to come. All of this language becomes something it's not to keep Christianity alive. Why did he not tell Abraham, the son of man is about to come in the glory of his father with his angels? 
and will then re recompense each, every man according to his deeds. Why did he not say to Malachi, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, especially for those who want to say generation means the race of Jews? Why not tell Malachi? Why not tell Isaiah? Or, you know, why isn't that in the Hebrew Bible? I mean, it's clear why when you study it honestly. Because the generation was the people Jesus was talking to. And a generation, biblically, is approximately 40 years. You've got one generation for this to happen. And after that, cognitive dissonance. Saying God's times, not your time, Second Peter. Finding ways to spiritualize it. Oh, no, 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 the kingdom is in you. The kingdom is in us. Ah, the, the kingdom is, ah, so we were wrong about the kingdom that Jesus was saying was going to happen soon. And this is where like the Gospel of Thomas and stuff comes in, where they literally, Gnosticism goes rampant on this and makes this something that it can thrive well with. Why is it that the second coming in the, is in the 21st century was imminent in the first century? I'm sorry. Why is it that a second coming in the 21st century was imminent in the first century, but was not imminent before the first century? There's no substantive, substantive defense against this objection. The fact that what God said was near to the apostles, he said was not near to the earlier prophets. Perhaps the clearest illustration of this truth is found in the co comparison of Daniel 8, 26, Revelation 20 through 10. And this is what I found really interesting as a preterist. In Daniel... Right here, let me let me zoom in a little more so everybody can really see what I'm doing here on this screen. All right. In Daniel, it's the angel says to Daniel, seal up the vision, for it is far off, or it shall be for many days. It's far off. Like the scroll, seal the scroll of this vision that I'm predicting here, for the time is far off. It, it, like it's distant. And this is in like, you, if you want to act like Daniel's 6th century BC just for the sake of argument, which this author here, David Green, thinks it is, whoop de doo But I'm saying 2nd century BC here, okay? I'm with the Antiochus Epiphanes dating of, of Daniel. That doesn't mean there isn't stuff in Daniel that might date back earlier, but I'm just not buying that the book of Daniel was composed in the 6th century. Either way, it's far off, and let's just say it was 6th century for the sake of argument. You got 600 years till Jesus, all right? 600, and it's called for many days. It's far off. When you get to Revelation, look what it says here, first century AD, right? Whether you say it's pre-70 or post, this guy thinks this was written before 70 because he's a full preterist, but I think it's late. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, he tells John, for the time is near. At the end of the book of Revelation, there's a part where the angel says, don't seal up the words. Daniel says, seal up the words, the time is far off. Either 200 or 600 years away, either way. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Everything that you're seeing in Revelation, the book of Revelation, is expected to happen soon, according to the book of Revelation. That can't be 2,000 years. There's so many reasons, from the mark of the beast being Nero uh, I've heard someone try to make a case in German about Hadrian, but it hasn't been translated into English, and the engagement in English scholarship is not there yet. Either way, I'm going with Nero on this one. Mark of the Beast, because in the Sibylline Oracles, there's also predictions of Nero's resurrection, that he's going to come back. And it was a big thing the Parthians were for, because they wanted Rome to be crushed, and they thought the Parthians in the East were like, Nero's coming back, and we're going to defeat Rome, blah, blah, blah. But why is he saying, don't seal up the words for the time is near? We have to understand simple words before we even get into seeing how Jesus is absolutely wrong. Because if far off means hundreds of years, let's give it, and near and don't seal up means thousands, then God is the author of confusion. Or these authors in the New Testament are not of God. However you want to do it, there's a problem here. Because now we don't know what language even means and what the hell are we doing? We're wasting our time even figuring out what the Bible's saying because they don't even know what they're trying to tell you. It's near, it's far, it's close, it's, you know, it's that thing. What? I don't even know what you're saying. 
if you're if you're not making it clear, I don't know what you're saying. So let me let me check in on y'all real quick here because I can get really worked up with this whole apocalyptic stuff because this is what led me out of Christianity to begin with. And I don't want to leave you hanging. Coming back, coming back, everybody. All right, I already saw that super chat, super chisel. Uh, Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. Everyone want to be gangsta, one-upping Jesus' resurrection with jobbers like Osiris and Dionysus. Yawn. I can't even pronounce this. Lucipi resurrects twice in her romance? Ooh, email me. Email me. Jason, I want to read some of this stuff. Please. Please email me. Well, you got me on. You're my you're on my Patreon. Like, message me. We got to talk sometime, by the way. I've been thinking about that. We got to talk sometime. But please email me. Um, let me put it in the chat here. It is in the description for those who don't know what the description is. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you here. And trust me, when I give you my email, it is my email. It doesn't mean anything else than it's my email. You won't be confused by it. You can contact me that way. You can contact me soon if you want to. And I would understand that to mean probably today, tomorrow, day after, whatever. So there you have it. There's my, uh, I just posted it in the chat. And also, little little advertisement again. While we're ahead of the game, please consider it. Go and sign up for Bart Airman's gospel courses, early bird special right now. It helps the channel and you can educate yourself on understanding the gospels. I always enjoy Bart's stuff. So there's a little shout out plug for that. Okay. Abel Chavez. I think the Abrahamic religions are like the engine of humanity. The atom has three main components. So to humanity as a whole, and even our brain has three main compartments. Also, maybe this is a link each religion for each. I don't connect those dots the way that you do. Um, I get it. I mean, there's people who are looking into everything for meaning and they're trying to find, like connect, we're pattern seeking creatures. So we're looking at everything to find meaning and, and patterns. And when those patterns happen or we find what I call coincidences that look like, that can't be a coincidence. How did that happen at that exact time or whatever? Um, I, I definitely think we are looking for those patterns. So if we find something of three, well, there's, there's a, Three days and three nights where Jonah and Jesus and, and Hosea talks about the resurrection. They're rising up on the third day or or even as um, when you're reading uh, Plutarch. Right here on Isis and Osiris, you'll find out Osiris dies and rises in, on the third day or kind of the idea of third day that we see in the New Testament. All I'm saying is, is like we could connect these dots but I wouldn't take them to their conclusion as if these are real absolute connections. The ancients used to look to the stars and they'd see Venus come up at a certain time in the year. I always make this equation because I like watching nature and as seasons change, but they, and I imagine we would have all done this when a certain time of the year comes about and you saw a certain star, which you probably thought there were gods and you saw that star rise, you would think it has the power because every time it rises, that time of the year, green, uh, fertility, sex, all of that good stuff that we have our plants and crops and whatnot start to come. Then that star be it gets connected to have the power of life. And I think that we connect dots that aren't necessarily there because we're looking for patterns. So I wouldn't connect those dots, even though it's interesting just to try and explore. And this is where a lot, a lot of academia would say, in this kind of thinking, my friend, they would say, this is parallelomania. And they would say, what, what we're doing is we're overshooting without any, we have to have a methodology to try and find out how these things are actually connected before we try and draw the conclusion. Like, is Venus really connected with why the earth actually goes and has the season of spring? Is it really connected in a literal way in any way? Can we prove it? Or is this something that we're connecting dots that aren't really connected? And that might be what that might be what's going on. I could be wrong. I'm just saying could be right about that. Thank you so much for that super chat though, for real. Uh, humanist reformation again. What about Matthew 24, 36 through 41? It seems clear in a world that uses sundials that he did not know exact time. We use minute or second. 
But just like Noah, Jesus knew it would be the disciples' generation, just as he says, 100%. In fact, let's pull up that pericope because you just threw me a tw uh, you threw me a whole bunch today in terms of money here, man. I, the least I can do um, is pull up the pericope. Let's go into Matthew 24. I don't know what version because the KJV only is they're just going to hate me no matter what. They're not going to care what I have to say. Let's look at Matthew 24 here. And I loved when I first became a full preterist, how clear this became. In fact, we should probably go to Matthew 23. At the end of Matthew 23, look what happens. Let me zoom in. Let me zoom in. Everybody who's blind like me, we're going to make this big. All right. All right. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And anyone who swears by the one who dwells in it and anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by one who sits on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind gods, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, blah, 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 blah. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, blah, 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 blah. You snakes, you brood of vipers. Jesus, calm down, Jesus. Come on. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel, Genesis, Adam, right? Like, like Abel, the first saint after Adam, if you will, to that of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar, so pretty much Jesus is blaming them for every righteous human on planet earth who's ever died at the hands of an enemy. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Who? Generation. The same Greek word that, Paul, that he uses about this generation will not pass away. Who is this? The Pharisees that Jesus is talking to. I don't know how much clearer that can be. A uh, generation means race of Jews. Come on. Okay, what a cop out. He's talking to Jewish people in his day, according to these gospels, condemning them. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And guess what happened? 70 AD. But Derek, that means it's fulfilled. That's where partial preterism and preterism comes into play. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we know who he's talking to. Then you get to Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. So they're leaving the temple. We know a place and we know who. Jesus is leaving the temple. He's walking by these buildings in the temple, around the temple, and his disciples, who existed at that time, go to ask him a question. And I wonder if they're going to ask him a question that might be relevant to them. Hmm. Do you see all these things? He asked, Jesus asked, truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. What's that talking about? The temple, the buildings of the temple. Clearly, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, which is right outside Jerusalem's temple, you can see it on the hill. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? Hold on. When will what happen? This is an odd question. When will what happen, uh, Mr. Whoever the disciple is who asked this privately? Well, the statement he said, where he says, truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another that will not be thrown down. When will that happen? Because they're on the Mount of Olives. His disciples asking Jesus, when will the previous statement that he just said about the stones, not one being left upon another, when will that happen? And what will be the sign of your coming 
and the end of the age. Now, I wonder if this is anachronistic. A lot of historical scholars would say the sign of your coming. They're already equating him with the Son of Man. Did Jesus really think he was the Son of Man? There are places where it sounds like he thinks he is, or they put it in his mouth. And there are times where it seems like he is thinking of a Son of Man that isn't him, that is like that of Daniel, a Son of Man that will come. So this is not a clear, this is a disputed scholarly debate that happens on the Son of Man, what is going on. But either way, the text says, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. And all of these ideas that you start to see, you start to go, whoa, a lot of this looks like the war in 70 that already happened. And so you keep on going and going and going and you find out, oh, snap, with the fall of the temple, they were expecting the end of the ages. They were expecting the absolute end to take place. This is where John J. Collins and all of these other wonderful scholars that I interview on Myth Vision come into play. And they do this all the time and showing. I feel like I've been blocking you guys from being able to see with this super chat. Um, let me take down that as well. Okay. Okay. There we go. So yeah, um, I should have been reading this with everybody seeing it, but this gospel of, the, gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And full preterists like to run to Paul and say, see, the gospel has been preached in all the world or to every creature. I think it's in Colossians. So they go, see, it already happened. It's all fulfilled. And this is the kind of stuff that uh, full preterists do to keep Jesus off the hook from being a fellow prophet. But he is, is expecting this all to happen. You, you can scroll down into Matthew 24 where he talks about this generation will not pass away. I'm trying to find that here now. Truly, I tell you, this generation, which generation? The one he's been talking to, the one he said woe to in Matthew 23. It's a continuation. It's the same people. He's saying, I tell you, this generation will, will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is where it gets interesting. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father, as it was in the days of Noah. So it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. From the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving up, giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about that that would happen until the flood came and took them away, all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come, but understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you, who's this you? Any reader 2,000 years into the future? Like, I get it. Christians love to read themselves into this literature, and I get it. This literature is sacred and holy and powerful to them. This is not talking to you. This is talking to the audience in which he's trying to convey this message to, which are people he's hoping, maybe even people right there on the Mount of Olives with him, the disciples, if at the very least the author of Matthew, let's give, if we're trying to be scholarly about this and we aren't sure that Jesus is literally saying these words, okay, maybe maybe these words are put in the mouth of Jesus by the author of Matthew, and Matthew's expecting the end to happen soon, whoever the author is that we're calling Matthew. And he's saying to you, whoever this reader might be, also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Or is he like, uh, Matthew's writing this going, you know, there's some Americans 2,000 years from now. These Americans will know, and they'll know when I say you, I meant Americans or well, 21st century uh, people. They'll know what every single Christian generation is expecting the end to happen. There are Christians in every generation who are reading this as if this is talking about them and their time. And it's like, when are we going to finally realize that this was all supposed to happen back then? 
and it goes on. All right. Sorry, I had, I had to get excited about that one because Matthew 24 is what really, really made me go, okay, I'm going to read in context. I'm going to do my best to understand what was meant to the audience that is being implied here. At least try to. Not, this is about me. And any day now, I used to have rapture dreams and nightmares, really, that the end happened. I had two of them. Rest non verba, thank you so much for the super chat. Hey, Derek, I was up until 3 a.m. painting my house the other day while listening to Myth Vision. I heard you did the same thing recently between producing Myth Vision. I can't imagine your hard work is appreciated, man. Thank you. Yeah, I've got, I, I was washing and I missed some of this paint here, but yeah, we're almost done with the kitchen cabinets. And then we have a one bedroom and a closet to paint. So that is my hopes, fingers crossed, uh, that I could get that done soon. But I'm also jumping in the shower. I got burnt by the sun today. And I said, let me come inside and do a live with my friends about how Jesus is wrong. I was inspired by Bart Ehrman listening to his uh, courses. Sam Thomas says, have you done a show covering Jordan Maxwell and Astro Theology? If not, that's a few hundred views and at least a thousand likes. Jordan Maxwell and a thousand, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan Maxwell and Astro Theology. I don't know if I have done, um, I th are we talking about the same Maxwell on Facebook, my buddy? Let me see. Just check in here real quick. Bear with me. Are we talking about a different, oh, Jordan Maxwell, man. So Jordan Maxwell was someone I got into for a while when I was kind of going through, I would call it a transitional phase of mythology, comparative mythology, where I was, I was, uh, how'd I put it? Wasn't really going into consensus scholarship. I was looking at all sorts of ideas and Jordan has some very fringe ideas, very, very fringe ideas. Um, there were like, he even says one statement. I can't remember before the first or second century, there were no Jews or something. I've heard him say some crazy stuff before. And I'm like, why did you say that? Or he'll do weird things with etymology. Like there's 12 Horuses, right? But then he says, if you change Horus, H-O-R-U-S. I'm going to put this in the chat. And since there's 12 Horuses and Horus represents time, just, just move around a few letters. Look at what I did there with the chat. Look at the chat. Horus and ours. Look how close they are. Don't you see it? Horus represents time. And because Horus is so close to ours, like that's the kind of stuff that he would do. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, dude, Jordan Maxwell is a freaking beast. He's the smartest guy I've ever met. And I'm like, I didn't know anything about like language or, and even now I still don't know language, but it was like, hold on. This is what the heck? Okay, I've got some real learning to do. Let me consider etymology from maybe someone who actually knows the language and is getting deep into this material. So appreciate you bringing them up. But astrotheology is something I like to study, I look into and see, is there some underlying uh, astrology uh, in the Hebrew Bible? And I think there definitely is in some spots. So I appreciate the super chat and I'd love to dive into some of that material. I do it sometimes already, but I'd love to get someone who may be a PhD diving into it. Doc Pleromonot, I'm going to have a hard time probably reading this because his words are so above my head all, all the time. Let's not forget about Paul's timing. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. 1 Corinthians 7.29 absolutely brother phenomenal passage and we're probably going to get into that whenever i can finally get around to the pericope but yes why would he be thinking this if the end is not near and these are the people these authors these books are the ones that we're reading to assume they got it right about jesus's resurrection when neither they or jesus got it right about the prediction of the end but we're supposed to accept and believe this is really credible, good material, reliable material on Jesus actually rising from the dead. But they can't get this right. And that is one good reason to say, 
hold your horses. It is okay to doubt. It's okay to doubt. It's okay if you have some type of psychological reasons you believe. But if you have doubts, I recommend understanding that's fine. There's a reason people doubt this stuff. And this is good reason. Paul didn't get it right. Jesus didn't get it right. Uh, the authors are trying to fix this problem. There's fulfilled eschatology or realized eschatology that starts to creep its head in, which starts to try and solve the problem. Well, we got it wrong. The kingdom, he's supposed to come in, kick their ass, rule from a, a throne. What the heck is happening? The Messiah and the kingdom, it didn't even happen like the whole Hebrew Bible is saying it's supposed to happen. What the heck? Oh, you know what? Actually, you know what? Maybe it maybe it is the kingdom's in us. And maybe, maybe this is what we're still waiting for. Or something's gonna happen. And they start to change their ideas in the New Testament. You see the meaning of these things start to take on new meaning. That's what that's what the scholars are all pointing to. And Doc, I know you know that. I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm saying most people haven't investigated this. So my bold claim of just saying Jesus is wrong <laughs> in the title, I think serious investigation will show that. Of course, if you have or if you really are suffering from cognitive dissonance, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, you will find a way around it. I asked Bart Ehrman one time when I interviewed him about contradictions, and I was dealing with Jonathan McClatchy and some of his trying to reconcile problems like Matthew with the talks about the two donkeys when all the other gospels mention one donkey and, and all these things that they're not contradictions. And finally at the end, I'm like, yeah, well, what about this? What about that? And Bart goes, listen, anyone who tries hard enough, if they want there not to be a contradiction, they can make anything they want happen. If they try hard enough, you can do it. And Bart's got a point. I know. Cause that's what all of the Christian movements I was part of was doing. And finally, I had to be honest. I had to stop BSing myself and realize that is what I've been doing. And people go, that's because you just want to attack Jesus. You just don't want it to be true. No, actually, I think it's exciting realizing that it's not. I mean, to be honest, if I'm just going to be honest, right? Christians can be honest in saying they believe Jesus rise from the dead. They could be honest in thinking that I'm going to hell. They could say all these things that are offensive, right? To some people, not to me. I don't care. You can think I'm going to hell all you want. But when I say it and I say, I'm actually excited to find out that this isn't true. And I'm excited because it really did do a toll on me mentally when I was trying to really live by this message and condemning my flesh what I have naturally, I was born into, did not have a choice to, I have to kill. I have to hate. I have to hate this life, Jesus says. If you love this life, you're going to lose it. Well, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul, right? But then there's that famous funny little statement after that, he gains the whole world. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I think I'll take that actually because at least I know that that's the case rather than I'm going to go to hell or fear the one who can burn that the, the body and soul in hell forever and all that crap. No, I don't. It's exciting to know nobody's going to cook and burn. Humanist Reformation, again, actually, Matthew 24, 14 actually reads, the gospels will be preached to all the Roman world, not world, as a testament to all the Gentiles, not nations, and then the end will come. The Greek was changed over time as the prophecy failed. Hmm. Hmm. I really, I need to look at those carefully and see through the gospels because in Luke, what's in interesting in Luke, Luke does something different. Let's go to Luke 21 real quick. I like this. Let's do it. And I think this is what you're talking about with the Greek, Greek term changing. All right. I'm going to pop it up. I'm going to take your super chat down. Thank you for the super chat. And thank you for all the support you've been given today. I really appreciate it. Okay, here we go. We're in Luke 21, which is the synoptic parallel. I'm looking for that whole, the fullness of the Gentiles passage, because you don't find that in Matthew and Mark like this. Okay. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, I thought to myself, 
tell me if you think I'm right about this. Could be wrong. But I thought this looks like an interesting uh, awareness of Romans 11. Remember, real quick, put this in your mind. All right. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled or the fullness of the Gentiles, it sounds to me. The times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Romans 11. We go down here, Gentiles, blah, 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 25. Where's it at? Okay. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the, until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. Now, I don't know about you, but all Israel, there's no way in hell in 70 AD. I was a full preterist who said it all was fulfilled. I tried to say all Israel was saved in 70 AD. There's no way in hell all Israel was saved when they all Israel practically, unless you want to count the dias, the diaspora Jews that are out in the nations, right? It's like they weren't harmed. But dude, 70 AD was the destruction, like absolute annihilation of Israel. Like what the freak? That's not saving them. That's destroying them. And so I don't think Paul had an, you know, an inkling about 70 AD when he wrote this. But this whole full number of the Gentiles, I think, pops up in Luke in his pericope on the whole particular of the synoptic apocalypse, I like to call it, the destruction in 70 AD. So I'm scratching my head here thinking, OK, they're they're trying. They're trying to figure this thing out. They're trying to keep this message going somehow and push it off just a little longer. Uh, well, the, the gospel would have been preached to all the nations, to all the Gentiles. And, and, and remember now, all the Israelites are going to be saved, whether it be Jews, whatever you want to call it. I just think that they keep on keeping on. Cognitive dissonance keeps setting in. All right, let me move on to the next Super Chat. Seriously, thank you for that one. Matthew 24 is fun. <laughs> I wish I had John Collins on here right now. He's so, his accent... And he is so good at this. Uh, he's written against N.T. Wright on Mark 13 because N.T. Wright thinks Mark 13 is completely fulfilled. Humanist Reformation is back. Find a God that can get their words right. That's real divinity. Seek facts, not faith. Otherwise, you're just going to be falling for any con, ancient or otherwise. Well put. That should be like a, like a, a card that someone gives for their birthday, you know? Hey, you're my friend. Read this. Here you go. Happy birthday. Uh, seriously, wise quotes. I'm not kidding. That is a really good quote, and I, I hope more people will take that advice, consider it, and uh, follow through. You know? I do. Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. Honestly, Sethians and other Gnostic had a better grasp of eschatology than mainstream takes. More indictment and condemnation of the Archons. I look, we need to get a whole show on apocalypticism and Gnostic thinking. That would be fun. I always love going to, to the Gnostic gospel or the gospel of Thomas is a Gnostic type gospel. When in saying 51, in fact, I can pull it up. Why don't we do that? Let's go here. Let's go to Google. Saying 51. Oops. 51, Gospel of Thomas. And I think, yeah, earlychristianwritings.com. This is always the best way to go if you're going to try and find a couple different translations. I love this, right? So I'm going to go with Blatz here. You can go with any of them. His disciples said to him, on what day will the rest of the dead come into being? Or, you know, when will the repose of the dead come to pass? On what what on what day will the rest will the shall rest come to those who are dead? The resurrection is the point. When is the resurrection going to happen? All right. And on what day will the new world come? He said to them, talking about Jesus, what you await has come, but you do not know it. That's called realized eschatology. They're already trying to solve the problem. Mark Goodacre wrote an entire book on the Gospel of Thomas, 
and how the Gospel of Thomas knows Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. It knows all four Gospels in the Gospel of Thomas. That doesn't mean there may not be material in the Gospel of Thomas that might somehow be earlier, but there's good reasons to say he's taken this conclusion, whoever this author is, has taken the logical conclusion of realized eschatology because there's a problem. And th that problem, cognitive dissonance, forces them to resolve it in different ways. But yes, uh, Jason Sobeck, Lord of the Four Corners, you are 100% on point. I enjoy listening to the Gnostics because I ne they're the underdogs. Who doesn't like listening to the people who were silenced, at least to hear what they have to say? Maybe be curious about what they have to say. Maybe they got something better to say than what was established in Orthodox. I know I'm that kind of person. Uh, curiosity killed the cat for me. You know, I wanted to know, well, hold on. Hold on. What other books are there? Why isn't Enoch in our canon? But it's in the Ethiopian Coptic, you know, canon. Why is it not in my canon? And the New Testament does have references from Enoch, one Enoch. What the heck? It's not scripture, but it's scripture, depending on what kind of community of Christians you're part of. But the New Testament itself used it. It always blew me away. Durin Chili's. Am I hope I'm saying that right? Did they believe Nero was Antichrist? Revelations said his name was 666 or 616. They thought Jesus was going to defeat the Roman Empire, but it never happened. Okay, so first of all, it appears that they thought Nero was a singular beast among the beast of plural. Um, I don't know about Antichrist being the term there. So I would say... No, if you're being strict, but I think you're implying, did they think Nero was the beast in Revelation? Let him who has wisdom calculate the number, for it is the number of a man. And yes, that to me was Nero. The, the Latin version of Revelation here literally calculates it to 616. And in what's called gematria or gematria, in the language of Greek, Hebrew, and whatnot, Aramaic even, there's alphanumeric sequence. So a letter equates a number. And so, of course, they were calculating in code the name Neron Kaiser, Nero. So 666 or 666, however you want to pronounce it, um, is 616 in Latin. I think that was Nero. Jesus was going to defeat the Roman Empire 100%. Without a doubt, Jesus and the 144 virgins... I don't know how boring that sounds to you, but that sounds kind of boring to me. <laughs> All right, I'm being silly, but I, I don't know if they mean literal virgins. Maybe they mean it literally. I wonder if it's kind of metaphorical for saying these are Israelites or Jews that did not um, defile themselves with the Roman Empire, who's called the Great Whore. So technically, she's a prostitute. And so if you are a Jew who's not buying and selling, taking the mark of the beast, which is the Roman Empire, meaning there isn't really someone out there with a stamp saying, all right, you want to buy? Come here. Come here. You know, but it's this idea of the right hand and the forehead is a symbol of the law in Jewish thought. And so it's a Hebraic thought. And here I think that that mark of the forehead and the right hand is symbolizing you're going against God. You know, don't take the mark. Don't buy and sell, or you're not going to be able to, you know, don't do this. I think I could be wrong, but I think this is what's going on here. And it's about Rome. And that's what I think it meant by they're not defiled by women or whatever. I could be wrong about that. Who knows? Apollos, Christian apologetics, second Thessalonians two, two pseudepigrapha rebukes pseudepigrapha. <laughs> Look, I think, I think I get what you're saying here. So here is a letter that is not Paul that is rebuking fake letters in the name of Paul. And this is a great, great, fun passage to go to where he's like, people are trying to write letters in my name. And Bart Ehrman and others have written about this uh, in Forged, in Counter Forgery, where he's like, this is a funny, smart author who's saying, hey, it's me, Paul. Others are writing letters in my name of Paul and they, they're not they're not really me. And it's really not Paul writing this letter who's trying to claim to be Paul. So he's trying to rebuke other letters that are going around about Paul. There, there had to be like a Paul cult running around. People were trying to say, Paul said this. No, he didn't. Let's all write letters to have Paul say something. 
Thank you for the super chat, my friend. And by the way, there's going to be a debate tomorrow at 5 p.m. Apollos is debating another Christian. I am the skeptic host. I will be moderating. But it will be Christian versus Christian on Myth Vision tomorrow. Stay tuned. Is Jesus God in the New Testament? Was he God? Did his followers think he was God? Whatever. And the other Christian thinks, no, he wasn't God at all. Never was claimed to be God. And so this debate is happening tomorrow and Apollos will be on. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. Seriously, appreciate it. All right, let me make sure I catch up here. Because this dang stream yard likes to skip. All right, Jay Bundy, I am taking over the internet. Thanks for chatting on my Pocket Locker 86 channel. Absolutely. We'll kick it soon. Chat, Guts at Gibbon made a video about me. Absolutely. So, Jay, I was last night I was impressed with how you handled yourself. I was watching on Guts at Gibbon's YouTube channel, and I found out about you. I didn't know you were on one of my panels one day. I was like, you know, it must have been like an open hangout room. But you were in a lab. You know what you're talking about, about evolution. And the way you handled those young Earth creationists who were anti completely denying evolution – and then trying to pretend you don't know what you know because you worked in the very lab and were writing peer-reviewed PhD dissertation material on the studies. I was amazing how she just picked that apart by using you. And um, I definitely want to talk to you about evolution if possible, Jay. I emailed you. Hope you got my email. Thank you for the super chat for real. Captain Dadpool in the hizzy. Go subscribe to Jay and Captain Dadpool. Keith, Pennsylvania, do you believe Jesus Christ is a metaphorical retelling of the Philosopher's Stone? Was Christ assumed to be a reincarnation of Hermes Trismegistus? I mean, look, I think that Jesus in the New Testament, there's a, I think there's a basic apocalyptic Jewish guy at the basis. However, if I were to try and put anything to compare Jesus to, I wouldn't know about the Philosopher's Stone. I would compare it to something contemporaneous in the Greco-Roman world that's probably closer in relation to the context, which would be the Roman emperors, number one. I think that Jesus is juxtaposed against the Roman emperors. And I also would go Jesus is against or being made a better. When I say against, that means the authors had in mind other deities Jesus is better than Dionysus. Jesus is better than these other gods and heroes that the Greco-Roman world would have worshipped. And so you got to compete everywhere you went. Near uh, Caesar is God, you know, like everybody knows this. So I would do that kind of connection before I would run off into something else. That doesn't mean that Gnostics or Alexandrian, Alexandrian Jews or Alexandrian Christians weren't doing stuff like this because they were. There's no doubt that there probably is something to this in Alexandria, Egypt, but I'm not so sure if the New Testament is trying to harp on that or not. So you're probably way smarter than me when it comes to this or making connections to this. I'm just looking at what I've been looking at and saying, wow, why are the titles of Jesus literally the titles for Caesar Augustus? They're ripping the titles and giving them to Jesus. And Here's Jesus with a coin with the image of a Caesar in the Gospels. And he's saying, give that which is God to God and that which is Caesar to Caesars. Notice he's separating God and Caesar. But on the coin, God is Caesar. So Jesus is dissecting and saying, Caesar is not God. And of course, the authors of the New Testament are saying, you know, Jesus is son of God, you know, giving him all these prince of peace, the same things that the Pax Ramada gave to Caesar Augustus in the first century. I hope that give you my thoughts. I mean, there could be more. It, it doesn't have to be only what I'm saying. It could be eclectic, including what you're saying, but I don't know. So you probably know some, I don't, you know, what's so funny. We haven't even gone into all these pericope yet. Ever heard the book, a history of the true religion by Duggar. I haven't where he does an awful job of linking the COG seventh day as the true church church of God. I think it is seventh day as the true church from Jesus. I have not. <laughs> he does an awful job of linking them. No, I have never heard of that. 
if the audience has, tell me, what do you think of that book? Email me if you think it's interesting, if it's something I need to look at, especially when I do stuff like this. Oh my gosh, Daniel. So many lost idolatrous Gentiles in here. We're so lost. We're so freaking lost. All right, let's go to the pericope. Back to preterism. Granted, it is not unreasonable to use an expression of imminence or brevity in reference to a relatively long period of time. 2 Corinthians 4.17, but it is biblical, biblically unreasonable to in, interpret every statement of eschatology imminence through the New Testament as meaning 2,000 years later or more. If we are going to claim scriptural support for such hermeneutical approach, the only option is to take 2 Peter 3.8, and that's the one I was telling you about that's a cop-out. He has a completely different interpretation of this because he believes that it's pre-70 AD and it's talking about the war in 70 and all sorts of nonsense. This book is a late, late book. Second Peter is late in the game. All right, the second technique is that it is employed to ground the New Testament declarations of imminence is to dichotomize the spirit of imminence and therefore the unified eschatological theme of scripture and to say that some or more New Testament imminent scriptures do indeed indicate nearness in time. Now let's go down to some of these scriptures because we can go on and on, all right? The prophetic message is so simple, yet is so profound in a way that is not surprising that we missed it for so long. Now, a final note. The Apostle Peter was referring to eschatology when he said, I'm not even reading it because he literally thinks the Apostle Peter wrote 2 Peter 3. We're not even getting lost into that debate on whether or not Paul or Peter wrote 2 Peter. All right, here's some of those time indicators in the New Testament that we're going to pay attention to. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. Now, I get it. Some people will go, oh, that's that's an easy one. You are the kingdom. Or the kingdom is like this little message that Jesus is bringing. That's it. But understanding that context of the kingdom in light of all of the Jewish eschatology at the time, everyone who understands Jesus within apocalyptic Jewish thought would walk away and go, yeah, the Jews are finally going to rule the world. How often have they been under the foot of Egypt? Um you know, let's 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 go. Egypt, we have Assyria, Medes, Persians, Babylonia, Greeks, um, and finally here the Romans, right? They're always a conquered people and never conquering. They're never ruling the world. And everyone else is ruling the world. When is God's people, Israel, gonna rule the world? That's why, like preterism is the while it makes tries to make sense out of all these time statements that I was part of, it is the biggest cognitive dissonance conclusion you can get because Israel got squashed in 70. They're not ruling the world. They're acting like they rule the world. No, it is the biggest cop-out. And it literally creates a big problem on not fulfilling, not fulfilling what God promised Israel throughout the scripture. So anyway, kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who warned you to flee from the wrath about to come? Well, we know what about to come is. I mean, not it's going to happen later. <laughs> it's about to happen, Matthew 3, 7. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. This is in the same context of this passage here, about to come. So it, it, he's saying, look, the tree's about to be cut down. His winnowing fork is in his hand. Same passage or area. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is an interesting one. This is one Delcy Allison Jr. talks about. And this one is not just him, uh, Schweitzer and other critical scholars who've done like the quest for the historical Jesus saw the problem. They saw it. You shall not have, you shall not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. I think we should turn there because in that passage, he's talking to the disciples. They won't even finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. This is Jesus talking. So, like, is Jesus saying himself? It doesn't sound like he's talking about himself. It's like he's talking to a third person, Son of Man, and he's talking about Son of Man coming. This seems to be a fossil. A lot of scholars think this is what we would call a fossil in the text that is a saying that Jesus may have actually said, 
because it's so bogus and it it's flopped on its head so bad that like it fails. There's no way to get around it. Like, what the heck? The Son of Man, they went either they went through the cities of Jerusalem or Israel, like they had already done it, but the Son of Man hadn't come yet. Like it's a failure. And there are other ways to try and interpret this. I know Delcy Allison Jr. has mentioned it in his commentary, but I mean, he even told me he's like, that that really looks pretty bad. That passage looks pretty bad. And he's a Christian scholar, but he's like, yeah, that one, mm, that one's pretty bad. It, it seems like there's a root to that. Maybe there's some historical kernel. The age about to come. About to come. This back then, not, not 2021, 22. The Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. This is a big one because Christians want to act in any way they can. Well, the Mount of Transfiguration fulfills something here because this is the one that they want to go to and go, this happened at the Mount of Transfiguration. It's all through the synoptics. There are some of those who are standing here who will not who shall not taste death, die. Well, standing where? Let's turn to Matthew 16. We're going we're gonna to get to the bottom of this one. This is one of my favorites. I'm going to check in on y'all here in just a second. I just go to the NIV because I'm, I'm a, obviously the NIV is the satanic Bible, and I just like to make in, uh, KJV only is angry. Duh. Okay, here we go. So, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples. He's talking to his disciples. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, that's quite an anachronism. Like, Jesus already knows he's going to carry a cross. It's like that interesting painting where... Jesus is being born and he's in the little cradle in the, in the little um, in the barn with the animals. And secretly there's a crucifix in the upper hand corner, like tacked on the wall of a, of a man on a cross. And there's Jesus. He just got born, but there's already a cross. Like that's how silly some of this stuff is that take up your cross. Like he already knows he's going to be on a cross. Now, maybe he's a fanatic, like, uh, like what we saw, you know, in nine 11, ready to go and commit suicide for the sake of his belief because Rome's going to destroy him. Or he's so fanatical. He thinks the angels of God are really going to come and rescue him on the cross. And I've actually heard people try to interpret that in Mark where he's like, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're supposed to come down here and like save the day, but I'm dying on this cross and you're not saving me. There's so many interpretations, but this seems to be a red flag. Anyway, who's he talking to? He's talking to Americans in 2022. No, he's talking to his disciples. And he says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone who gained the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the son of man is going to come in his father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Now, that has not happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. I don't care what cognitive dissonance degree you have in your brain. This has not happened, even in the context of what we see in these Mount of Transfiguration passages. These Mount of Transfiguration passages where he's kind of showing his essence, his his divineness. I see it as an apotheosis, like what's going to happen. It's reflecting the future coming, I think, of Jesus. In fact, in Acts, he goes up into the clouds. And what's Acts say? He's going to come back in the same manner that he went up into the clouds. Okay, it hadn't happened yet. But he's saying that this is supposed to happen, right? Well, he tells you even better. Truly, I tell you, Jesus is telling you, some who are standing here, whoa, standing where? Who's standing there? Go up, 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, he's talking to his disciples, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That has not happened. But this created a huge, huge problem in the early church. How do I know? Read the Gospel of John, and we're going to turn there. Remember, some standing there would not taste death. The promise was that some one, one of the disciples, it had to be one of them, they had to be there. They had to be alive, right? Because one of them had to be alive at least before all this stuff happens. The Gospel of John is one of the biggest on realized eschatology. But to me, when you get into that last chapter, is this the last chapter? Yes, he asked Peter or Kephas, you know, Simon Peter, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And that sermons come out of this so often. And then third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. Uh, well, not all things. Remember, he says, well, not even I know the day or hour in which I'm supposed to come, right? So he doesn't know all things, Peter. Get your facts straight. Haven't you read Mark? Anyway, um, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Derek, you're taking all to be all too literal. Anyway, Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very, verily, truly, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Now, remember, he tells Peter, dude, you're going to die. Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. These are the disciples. All right. And then Peter's like, dude, I don't like this. What about that guy, you know, the beloved disciple that was leaning on your chest? What about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain until I return alive, listen to this. This is, remember, some of you standing here, Matthew 16, Mark 13. I think it's not Mark 13, Mark 9, sorry. Some of you, it's a synoptic parallel. Some of you standing here, disciples, will not die. And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive, until I return, second coming, or the coming of the Son of Man. I, I would suspect John already has him saying he's outright God in some sense or equated somewhere on the level up there with God. Um, until I return, what is that to you? So like Peter, if I want him to stay alive till I return, remember that return he talked about? What is that to you? You follow me. Because of this, well, because of what? Because of the saying Jesus just said. I want him to remain alive until I return, just like he said in Matthew 16, Mark 9, other passages. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die because Jesus did not say, or sorry, but Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I come, what is that to you? Now, notice the cop out here already. Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, notice the apologetic here. This author's already pulling off apologetics like a pro. He didn't say, like, he, he wasn't saying that, but like, he only said, if I want him to remain alive until I come, what is that to you? So Jesus could, if he wanted to let him stay alive, but nah, you know, he, he didn't really say that. He say, he's just saying, if he wanted him to remain alive, like, come on. Bad? Did you get the stuff? No. Can you grab it? Sorry, there's paint on our back. We painted all this stuff on the back porch. Please bear with me for one moment. And if you had any super chats, I will catch up to you. 
I'm going to put some music on. My wife needs me to help grab these things real fast. Hold on. I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere, I'm coming. Woo! All right, whoo! Ah, it's raining. My shoulder's killing me. All right, I've been painting all day. Told you it would only be soon. I didn't lie, did I? My timing and my words are on point. I'm not going to make up stuff about that. Woo! Mm, bear with me. Let me catch up with everybody here in the chat. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this is the last one. I'll look and check. Bear with me. Matthew 24, 30 clearly says the nations will mourn the coming of the Son of Man, so the transfiguration does not work. 100%. Absolutely. Thank you again for that super chat. I always tried to find a way. That's why I wanted to argue that it did happen. Not that transfiguration was it, but that the second coming was 70 AD. I tried my damnedest as a Christian to keep on to it. Oh, hold on. There's another one here. Yep. Another promise Jesus gives his disciples. They were to be persecuted and not get through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. They got through all the cities of Israel, then some. <laughs> well, look, Paul, if we, if we count Paul, right, and Paul's still waiting on the end, Paul's trying to get to, uh, to, to Spain. Paul's writing to Rome. He's trying to go and get them. He's trying to get a foothold in Rome in his letter to the Romans. And he's like wanting to head off as far as Spain. Like that's beyond the cities of Israel. So there's no doubt that he thinks that a part of the eschatological expectation is to get the nations. Um, and he says that point blank in his letter to the Romans, that the nations play a significant role. His whole Gentile mission is actually the whole reason Jews aren't accepting his message. And he's trying to explain this. Okay. Wait for Derek's second coming. But unlike Jesus, I actually did show up. You can't say that I didn't. And some of you watching this would not. Actually, I almost could have made an absolute claim there before we left. Good point. Without My wife looked at me with like those eyes. You know, I had to go, but uh, I had to hurry up and help her. But I could have made a bold statement that all of you sitting here watching this would not taste death till Derek got back to his seat. Now, that's a bold claim. We had like 300 and something people watching at the time. So that's a pretty bold claim. There's a chance, right, that someone at that moment might have had to go. Something, you know, might have been their time. Discovering Ancient History with Pat Lowinger. Thank you, Pat. 
More evidence. John is early second century text. Hmm. You know, you're talking about the uh, passage that I'm particularly talking about here, I think. Let me, let me see where we left off here. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm Without a doubt, I'm, I'm convinced that John's early second century. I mean, at least I couldn't put a date specifically, but I would say it's later. Especially in light of its reacting to some of this other stuff, just like the pastorals. They're reacting to versions of Christianity that are saying Jesus did not come in the flesh, which I think that's why John has him sitting there eating fish and all that fun stuff at his resurrection. But then again, keeping in mind, I also know that there are scholars who say that there's like three versions to John, like, like it's got layers to it. And what we have is the final version of John because John chapter 20 ends like the end of a book. And then John chapter 21 starts over like it doesn't even realize that the book just ended at 20 and then has a whole extra chapter tacked on. Makes you kind of go, what the heck? Let me see something here. So end of John 21 is a bold statement where he says, uh, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. All right. And th this is the disciple who testifies to these things, who wrote them down. We know his testimony is true. Oh, we do? Yes, we do, because we believe. All right, and then uh, at the bottom here, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. End of the book of or the Gospel of John. Oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> Let's start over. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. Ah, most scholars see that and they go, hold up. That was added later. Um, but yes, Pat, um, everybody go subscribe to Biddy Buddha's YouTube channel. Pat, I hope you're still rocking and rolling over there. I've been busy trying to get my house right. Forgive me, my friend. I have been busy, 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 busy. Um, Lauren says, so confusing. I dropped out. When I got back, Derek is gone. Lauren, I'm here. I'm here now. Everything is going to be better now. Everything. <laughs> uh, good to see you in the chat, Lauren. Therion, Derek was a true believer after all. Yes, I was. I like how the beginning has no audio. You must be talking about the video, beginning of this video. <laughs> I'm making sure I catch everybody here. Okay, let's go back to time statements. Let's have more Bible study here. We're only at number 10. There's only 101. We're not going to probably get through all of them, but when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine, gr vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. When the chief priest and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. Hmm. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. That goes same kind of statement, if you will, like we see over here in Mar uh, Matthew 16, about not all of them would die. In fact, the disciples in Matthew 24 are asking Jesus, hey, when are these things going to happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? And he's telling them, like, this matters to you here in the first century. From now on, you, Caiaphas, the chief priest, the scribes, the elders, the whole Sanhedrin, shall be seeing the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Matthew 26, Mark, Synoptics. The kingdom of God is at hand. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine growers. It's another one of the passages from Matthew. And you notice this started with Matthew, this whole, this whole website here. Because I'm sure as Christian believers, he thinks that this is all like Matthew was the first gospel. But critical scholarship would say Mark. Most of the scholars would say Mark. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Who warned you to flee the wrath to come? The axe is laid at the root. His winnowing fork. This is just a synoptic parallel of what we read earlier. What therefore will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these vine growers again. Another passage like that. 
These are the days of vengeance in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. These are the days, 2022. No, they're trying to say, look, it's happening here. It's going to happen in the, in the author's lifetime. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I mean, it's so obvious what that's trying to say. Like, this has got to happen. Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. So this is that one that I showed you. Um, no, I'm sorry. Stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills cover us. That sucks. We were hoping that he who was the one who is about to redeem Israel. Hmm. So redeeming Israel is part of the plan or is supposed to be part of the plan. I will come to you in that day. You shall know that I am in the father and the and you and me and I and you the Lord uh, Lord. Sorry. What then has happened that you are about to disclose yourself to us and not to the world. If I want him to remain until I come, I read that in John earlier. This is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel, and it shall be in the last days. Acts. They think they're in the last days in Acts, and Christians still think they're in the last days thousands of years later. And I hope that's not the case in a thousand years from now, but wow. I mean, it won't shock me. Thousands of years, people have been saying, last days, we're in the last days, it's the last days, it's the la just finally realized that it's wrong. You know, he has fixed a day in which he is about to judge the world in righteousness. Acts 17, 31. That's that place where Paul's talking to the uh, Epicureans and the Stoics. And he's trying to convey his resurrection theology about Jesus. And they were like, hell no. -da no, no, no. Very few followed him after that. There is about to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. There is about to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. There is ab, 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 about to be. When? In 2022. Come on. As he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment about to come. Hmm. Judgment about to come. Not for the sake of, not for Abraham's sake only was it written that faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, but for our sake also to whom it is about to be reckoned. Hmm. If you are living according to the flesh, you are about to die. I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. Paul is on the precipice of time. He is on the razor's edge of the end. And he is like, don't even, don't even have, don't even sleep with your wife. Like pretend you're not even married. Paul is saying stuff like it is done. Like you, just, you might as well just stop, you know, worrying about anything. Stop suing each other in court. Stop acting like you're married. Don't even do it. Just get ready because it's about to happen. Like this is almost on par with like the Heaven's Gate cult anticipation apocalyptic thinking. If not as apocalyptic, like it's that clear. He's thinking Jesus is going to come in the heavens. I mean, what did Heaven's Gate teach? That like Jesus in a spaceship is going to fly over and suck them up into this spaceship and take them off to another planet or something. You can't tell me 1 Thessalonians 4 doesn't sound like that. Those who are dead, you know, in Christ, you know, the first fruits of the resurrection and whatnot, where he talks about, and we who remain and are alive at his coming will be caught up with the Lord in the air. Like, what is that? Come on, Paul. It is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Hold up. To awaken from sleep for now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Like he is thinking the end is going to happen at any moment now. I'm on a live, Neil. You want to say hey? Oh, shit, I forgot. 
How how is a buddy who's a member of my channel of Myth Vision? How are you not aware? No, it's your fault, bro. I'm blaming you. The end is near too. The apocalypse is coming after you, man. Oh shit, I'm fucked. I'm screwed. <laughs> All right, brother. <laughs> he's so he's embarrassed. He's like, oh man, what the heck, dude? Why'd you do that? I do that every time he calls me too. I'll be like, yeah, what's up? Hey, mom. Yeah, say hey to 300 people, you know? Why not? Why not? Your family, everybody watching is family. Even the people who hate me in the chat, they're family too. I don't care. I would have hated me too 12 years ago if I was saying this stuff. Okay. Let me scroll down. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anybody here. All right, here we go. Gnostic Informant, subscribe. All right, yeah, the hour for you is awaken from the sleep. Okay, so it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer. You know how Christian's talking about, I'm already saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Like Paul, while he could argue that like the pneuma of Christ was in him, the spirit of Christ was in him, so he had a form of a seal, right? He believed he's sealed. If you go to Romans 8, let's go to Romans 8 real quick. I remember as a Calvinist, I used to like run here and stuff. All right. So let's see. To those who are called, to those who are predestined. Da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, okay. So not only so, but we ourselves who have the first, who have the first fruits of the spirit. So the Panuma, the first fruits of the Panuma, the spirit, grown inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption to sonship. Okay, our adoption to sonship, to the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, past tense, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. We hope, or who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. So it's like an already but not yet type of salvation. Paul, Paul thinks it's already started, but he's anticipating it. And in Romans 13, he's saying, for, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone. The day is at hand. It's, it's almost there. Get ready, everybody. The spaceship's coming, baby, and we're going to go with this, this extraterrestrial Jesus. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Soon. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. That's weird. He's writing to the Roman church, to the church, to the Christians in Rome. Did he, did say, did they crush Satan under their feet or what the heck? The time has been shortened. First Corinthians 7, 29. And I always, when I read this, I always thought to myself, is this saying like God went like, all right, you know what suckers? You're pissing me off. I'm speeding up the time now. Hey, you lost 10 minutes to the apocalypse. It's coming sooner now. It made me think like Paul's so frustrated. He's so sick and tired of the crap he's dealing with, with some of these people that he's writing to. He's like, you know what? The time has been shortened. That's it. You, Some guy in your church is sleeping with his mom. All right. Everybody's speaking in tongues and looking like nutcases. People don't even want to walk in your church because you're not having any control or balance. You're to think you're crazy. God's shortening the time now. That's it. That's it. I've got to zoom in a little more so everybody can really see what's going on here. Um, the form of this world is passing away. 731. Now, remember, this is a few verses after he says, the time has been shortened. The form of this world is passing away. And most of the scholars I talk to either say Paul has a concept of middle Platonism or stoicism. Trolls Ingberg Peterson makes a strong case to argue Paul has stoic thinking in mind. They do not care for the things of this world. This world is corrupt and all, I mean, like that's just not, not just your, your flesh, but all of this world is going to pass away. I think that's why he says in Romans that creation is groaning in, in birth pangs. Like, like creation is ready to give birth to a new creation, like destroy the old one. A whole new one's coming in. Now these things were written for our instruction upon whom, who? First Corinthians, whoever the church of Corinth in the first century, 
Paul says, now these things were written for our 21st century, 22nd century, 23rd century. No, he's talking to the church in Corinth for our instruction upon whom, upon the Corinthian church, upon the first century, whom the end of the ages has come. Like they think this is about to be it. We shall not all fall asleep, but so, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. When has that happened? Hmm. That hasn't happened yet. Mer Maranatha, the Lord comes. Not only in this age, but also in the one about to come. Ephesians 1.21. It's the age about to come. When's that going to happen? Hmm. The Lord is near, Philippians. Or Philemon. I'm not sure if that's Philippians or Philemon. I think that is Philippians because that's Paul. Could Let me double check here. Philippians 4.5. I like to double check. Let's make sure we're all right here now. The Lord is near. So yeah, it's Philippians 4, 5, in case you're wondering for a passage, you want to go and double check. This, this, by the way, the link to this page is in the description. The person who wrote this and put this together is a full preterist believing Christian, but they're a heretic according to most Christians. And I love going to it because all he's doing is pointing out the pericope of the text in the New Testament where it's showing clear text that the end is near and that all of this stuff should have happened back then the gospel who proclaimed in all creation under heaven who uh, was proclaimed in all creation under heaven there's like a past tense they want to argue that that actually was like everything all creatures all humans have already heard the gospel in the first century things which are shadow of what is about to come colossians like they're expecting a whole transformation of the world we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. I'm only at 47. There's 101 in this thing. Anyway, I like this one. We got to read this one though. And the, well, the next few in the Thessalonians passages, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. And Paul's including himself here. And he's addressing a problem in the Thessalonian church about people who've been dying. And they're like, Paul, like, my Uncle Bobby's dead. What the heck, man? What's going to happen for Uncle Bobby? And Paul's going, oh, hold on, hold on. Okay, so those who are already dead, that, that's that's fine. They're going to go. They're, they're, they're going to be the first ones to go up with the Lord. Don't worry. But we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. You know, and then, and then a spaceship's going to come. I'm, I'm just kidding. You, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. It's coming when you least expect it. It's going to happen any moment now, Paul thinks. May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That one doesn't seem to give a clear, clear time statement. But with Paul, he just got done smacking you in the face with, like we who are alive and we're going to be here. And he, he expects himself to be in this. So this is just a chapter later. It is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. That's not ever happened I'm aware of. I mean, geez. Godliness holds promise for the present life and that which is about to come. I mean, they're all thinking it's about to happen now. We're at 50. Should we stop at 50? Let me check and see where you're at. Let me check everybody here in the chat. Make sure you're all alive still. Because I did promise that some of you listening to this would be alive before I ended all of these pericopes. That's, that's my bold prophetic statement. All right, I'm trying to go back up here, make sure I got everybody. I don't even know where I left off. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I know where I left off. I know all things except the time or the day or exactly when, you know, 
all these things are supposed to happen. <laughs> yeah, spacesuit. That's right. Spacesuit. Jason's so back in the house. Good point, because he talks about taking on there's flesh of the stars, which is a weird word to use for it because we wouldn't think that way. But there's a flesh for the moon and the sun and the stars. And they have a different flesh and so weird. Paul's got some weird thinking there. In fact, I'm looking forward to hearing um, hearing uh, Dr. Robin Faith Walsh. She's writing on the moon and Paul. There's some weird stuff that is floating around contemporaneous to Paul's time about the moon that we need to kind of know, she said. Humanist Reformation, again, wow, you are showering me with blessings today. Ha, ma, ma, she, ma, ba, 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 ba. You are healed in the name of myth vision. Um, the message from Jesus' own mouth in the divine word of God is clear. Jesus was to return before the disciples' generation passed away. You don't get more authority and power than those written words. Absolutely. It's pretty clear. We're doing a disservice to Jesus if we're not being like fair with his words, right? That's how I see it. Keith, Pennsylvania, is there a link between 12 disciples and the Zodiac, I think you mean to say? Um, there's some people who've made the case. They try to argue that. We know there's 12 tribes of Israel. I don't know if you have to necessarily think of a Zodiac. I'm not going to rule out that there is some type of possible connection in the sense that, I'm not saying a direct connection, but in the sense that people would, they compartmentalize things into 12 because their calendar is built into 12. And maybe this is somehow fulfilling a sacred connection that they see with a calendar. When we look at Enoch, when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were big on the calendar. There was a dispute between lunar and solar calendar. And you kind of wonder, is there something to do with the calendar here in Jesus and him having 12 followers? Or is it just symbolism in a say, in a way of saying, hey, I'm going to have 12 people follow me because there are 12 tribes of Israel. And in the end days, there's a lot of prophecy in the Hebrew scripture or Septuagint, depending on what you're looking at, for the redemption of Israel, meaning the 12 tribes. And in fact, Jesus says to his disciples at some point, whether it's Jesus or not, I don't see why we couldn't say it was him, um, that you will judge you will be seated on 12 thrones and you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Hmm. That hasn't happened. So I don't see why we couldn't say Jesus or something like this would have bit in the mouth of Jesus. He promised his early followers maybe uh, that they would sit on 12 thrones. It might make sense for why one of the mothers approaches Jesus with her sons and goes, please, will you have this son sit at your right hand and this son sit at your left hand in the kingdom? What the? What, what are you talking about? The kingdom hasn't come. Are you talking about like in thousands of years from now? Or where is this kingdom that you're talking about that's going to have people sitting on thrones and stuff? Anyway, sounds like there could have been a route there. I wanted to sidetrack because I don't necessarily think that the Zodiac plays a direct correspondence. However, if we look at some examples, and I'm going to pull one up right now, there are synagogues. I'm going to pull it up. I can spell the dang word. Zodiac. The best thing I can do is really just pull up images to show you. It's the best thing I can do. Zoom in on some of this here for you. So these are real Zodiacs in synagogues, and I don't know their dates. Um, I'd have to go and like click and find out their dating and stuff on some of these websites. But these are Jewish synagogues that have Zodiacs in them. This one may not be, is it? Yeah, yeah. In the diaspora, they had Zodiacs with 12, 12 sections because it's a calendar which they had 12 tribes of Israel, there may be a correspondence in some way, shape, or form. And I heard that they had found a synagogue in Galilee, I could be mistaken, with a Zodiac in it. If Jesus is from Galilee, as it seems to indicate, somewhere in the region of Galilee's, you know, um, looking at uh, Nazareth and whatnot, up in the Galilee region, he may have been inspired. Who knows? It's possible. I don't rule it out. Thank you so much for that super chat, though, Keith. I really appreciate that support. I'm um, skipping down. Yep, 
That's right, Joy. Sell your stuff because it's happened in any moment. I almost want to play that part. Uh, where is he at? I'm going to have to. I think that's the best thing I can do. Wouldn't you say so, my friends? The last hour of the... Uh, was it the Jehovah's Witness? Here we go. <clears throat> this guy right here makes me laugh. Okay. I hope everybody else gets a laugh out of this with me because we're about to have a little bit of fun. This this is one of the goofiest sounding guys that I've... Here we go. I don't even care. Here we go. The spread of this disease is distressing, to be sure. But we're really not uh, surprised to see the world in the grip of such pestilence, are we? Jesus made it clear <laughs> at Luke 21, 11, that pestilence would be part of the sign of the last days. Now, now, serious question, uh, serious statement. I'm going to be serious about this. There hasn't been pestilence since Jesus' days until now. No pestilence at all, you know? So this guy might be on to something. No diseases, the Black Plague, that didn't really happen. Come on. Are you kidding me? Shh. Let's keep hearing the prophet. And in Revelation chapter 6, the ride of the fourth horseman includes mention of deadly plague. Oh, oh So the events unfolding around us are making clear than ever, that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days. Gee, how did I not know this? Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Oh my I mean, that is some powerful stuff. The final part of the last day part of that single minute of the hour of the last second of the last days where there's pestilence because there hasn't been pestilence for 2,000 years till now. And we know because there's a horse rider that's going to come out of heaven and in and, and the book of Revelation says so. How do you feel, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing that amazing news? Aren't you so impressed? I am. I'm like, why didn't I know this already? Like, this is amazing. I'm really impressed with that guy. I'm telling you. Who else is impressed? I, I, Abel's, Abel's not impressed that Jesus got crucified. He, he's wondering why wasn't a woman Mary crucified? I don't know. You know, it would not shock me with the, with the, um, patriarchal misogynistic world they lived in. If they thought women's blood was half the price or wasn't as powerful or some ridiculous crap. I don't know. I made that up, but I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I would just say it's a patriarchal world and maybe that there's this guy, Jesus was really leading a movement and he probably got killed by the Romans for saying something that got him into trouble. And he was a fanatic who thought the end was going to happen near, but he was wrong. So they put him to death because they thought this guy's got a little bit of a following and we don't want an uprising during Passover. <laughs> Nail that guy to the cross. That's my, th my thoughts, but Abel, good question. It really is a good question, though. I really, really seriously mean that. I don't know the answer to that. I'm being funny here because I just got done speaking in tongues. Forgive me, my friend. Forgive me. I think I just blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I don't know what to do after this. Jennifer Sills, four disciples are represented in the, I want to say, cardinal directions. Matthew, the man, is Aquarius. John, the lion, is Leo. Luke, the ox. Is Taurus, Mark, the eagle? Is Scorpio cathedrals often featured the Zodiac? Cathedrals often featured the Zodiac, sorry. Yeah, I've heard that early church fathers actually argued that they are the four, um, what is it? There's four directions, but also um, it's something with the church fathers that argued this exact point. And my brain has gone shish kebab because the sun earlier. But yeah, I've heard this is something that they make the point of. And there are four beasts, I think, in Daniel that come up and there's some people who want to make these connections. Like they keep on one of the four kingdoms and things like that. They, they, there's something with the four. 
and she strikes back again. Jennifer strikes back again. I see it because it popped up. Gnostic informant, I'm sorry I was so cranky about the Greek history thing. I do appreciate your work. That means everybody go subscribe to Gnostic informant. If you don't want pestilence in these last days to get you because they haven't been here for 2000 years. I didn't know if you knew that, you know, but they're here now. <laughs> Shoot. Know what I'm saying? Subscribe. Neil is in the chat. Gnostic informant is in the chat. The son of man is right here right now. Are you going to deny him? I've denied him thrice in the cock crowed, but let me tell you, I'll never do it again. I've, I have beholden his glory with my very eye sockets. It's real. Anyway, let's hear the rest of this guy's uh, amazing, prophetic, powerful, powerful. I got to play that last part again because it just it tingled me in my spirit. You know what I mean? Here we go. Part of the No, no, no. Say it again. Say it again. Than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, mm. shortly before the last day mm. of the last days. <laughs> Did y'all feel that? Tell me y'all felt that. I felt that tingling. Jesus wasn't the last Adam. He was the last Eve. Uh, Celine, what is her? I can't remember her last name. Yes, she wrote a book on the rape of Eve and actually goes into this. Uh, but also Neil has that episode with her. Neil's laughing because he doesn't want you to know that he really is the son of man. From Trailer Park Boys for a second. <laughs> Listen. You know you feel it, Melody. You know you feel it, Ethan. You know it's true. Look, look, I'm not lying here. This is the spirit of truth. Hallelujah. This is it. At last. Oh, my God. My she, my papa. Marcia, yep, you feel it. Everybody, ooh, look, even Jason dropped the mic. He knows. He knows what it is. Daniel's feeling the spirit. Come on, can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Only minutes to go. The end is nigh. Get your money in 10% right now. Blessings from heaven will condense, compact, and they will fall on you right now. Throw that money. Throw your money. Write your checks. $1,000 right now. Who wants that blessing? Come on, throw that $1,000 at me. Who wants that blessing? I know you want that blessing. <laughs> All right, I'm an idiot. All right, let's go back to um, the serious stuff. Let's go back to the serious, serious stuff where the last part of the final seriousness of the last day of the spirit part is. Yeah. I'm confusing you now, aren't I? All right. We're on 51 now. Jeez. We only have 50 more to go. I charge you that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I got a serious question. If you're going to write a church in wherever first Timothy is, wherever you're writing this to, if you're going to write this letter to someone and you're going to tell them Keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. What use would this matter? Like, why would you tell them this if you knew that the end was going to be thousands of years into the future? Or if you had any idea that it wasn't the end then? Like, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for that which is about to come so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed about to come. In the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self. Jeez, that's, that could only be now. Like, men have never loved themselves until 2022, you know? So it's pretty obvious now with that passage that it's today, duh. Avoid these men. Who's he talking to? For of those, or for of these, the, are those who enter into households and captivate weak women. Dang! Men have only taken advantage of women just recently in 2022. That's a recent thing. So this is evidence that it's talking about today. 
you know, because men have never, you know, taken advantage of, you know, weak women. That's never happened, you know, till now. These also oppose the truth, but they will not make further progress for their folly will be obvious to all. What I'm trying to say is this crap is all talking about stuff back then, and I'm being sarcastic. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is about to judge the living and the dead in 2022. No, in the first century, whenever these things are being written. Like, they're, it's got to happen then. But because this has not happened, this has failed. So when it fails, when you already have faith that is deeply seeded into Christianity, you can't just let it go. You don't know how. So what do you do? You rationalize. You try to reinterpret the meaning. You try to make it say, oh, no, he did judge the living and the dead. Uh, at the top, you find ways to make it work, but then language stops meaning what it means. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. The author of Hebrews, whoever that is, it's a, an, an anonymous author. The church liked, church fathers liked to try and say it was Paul because they had 13 letters they attributed to Paul, but we can't have 13, that unlucky number. It's got to be 14. Seven times two, the perfect number, times two. Remember, Jacob served for 14 years for the woman he loved, Rebecca, but he got Leah after seven, right? So there's always a biblical precedence for having 14. So they said Paul wrote Hebrews. Hebrews is aware of Pauline theology, but it seems more middle Platonism, middle Platonic. It has like a duplicate of heaven and earth type concept, whereas Paul seems more stoic, it seems to me. Anyway, He's saying, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. They are living in them last days, and they've been saying that forever. Are they not all ministering spirits, spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who are about to inherit salvation? About to inherit salvation? What the heck is going on here? He did not subject to angels the world about to come. <laughs> and have tasted the powers of the age about to come. You know, I wish people like uh, Mike Winger, who just dropped another video on YouTube, would like actually engage with all of these passages and not, you know, abscond from all of them. Like he literally finds a way to get away from them. In fact, just to give everybody a little tease, I am going to be doing an episode with Joshua Bowen and Kip Davis on flat earth cosmology and solid dome cosmology. We're going to be picking apart Mike Winger's Bible, you know, video. He has so many people who literally buy what he's saying. And I'm like, come on. Like it makes them feel good. I don't know. I don't know what to say. It's like, if I can give you a feel good message, you're just you'll you'll just believe what I say, and as long as it makes you feel good, you know. Yes, that does sound sexy. Absolutely, that is true. That is true, man, bear pig. That is true. Caterpillar in the hizzy. Everybody, give caterpillar a shout out. That's right, hell caterpillar. We bow down to your righteousness. All right. Um, you know what's weird? Have I been showing you this guy this whole time and not actually showing you? No. I hope you've been seeing this page. All right. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. We're, 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 we're doing this together. I can't believe I'm two hours and 20 minutes in and I'm not burnt from the sun today. All right. Let's uh, go down here for ground that drinks the rain, which often falls upon it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and a near and near a curse, and its end for is for burning. I, I, I butchered that reading that. Forgive me. All right. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever 
is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. You know what's ready to disappear? You know what's ready to be gone? I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and type it out here. We're going to we're going to pull it up. I need, what am I doing? I don't need to do that. I need to do it here. Revelation to Revelation 22. Not 222. 22. All right. I think this is where the new heavens comes down. Is it? Nope, it's Revelation 21. Let's go to Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There, where, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. Shoot, man, he's saying some serious stuff here. Write this down, John, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. It's done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Reminds me of that game, for those of you who are gamers, Fallout 3. The game Fallout 3 is an apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic game. And it's taking place in Washington, D.C. And the whole goal of the game is to make the waters clean so everybody has water to drink. Your mother dies giving birth to you in the game. And, and her favorite verse is from Revelation right here. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, and those who don't agree with all of my thinking <laughs> in every way, shape, or form, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. All right, I'm going to skip down here because it goes into the 12 tribes again, 12 stones, all this stuff. What I like about Revelation 22 is how it tells you that all this crap that he describes is going to happen soon. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Like all of those promises and he's saying I saw this and all of that. Like all of that to me becomes bunk. Once you actually see him say it's all going to happen soon, but it doesn't happen. Why would I believe any of that stuff when it doesn't happen when you say it's going to happen? I mean, the next, the next verse, I mean, how much clearer can it be? Look, I'm coming soon. And Christians just go like, it's almost like they read their Bibles oftentimes. And I'm talking about mainly like evangelical Christians, you know, fundamentalists. The Lord who, uh, the God who inspires the prophets sent his angels to show his servants. And then they skip this. And then they skip this right here. And then they go, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I am John who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard them and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me, but he said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll, worship God. That's that part where he says, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. All of this stuff did not happen and it failed. And Jesus and his followers were wrong. They were wrong. All right, 
I'm going to pause. We're 61 now. I'm going to come check you out, see if everybody's still alive. Remember, I promise that uh, some of you watching this will not taste death before I finish all of these pericopes. I might die before you, actually. My wife might kill me because I'm taking so dang long out here. Earth isn't flat in Seattle. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you for the super chat. I don't know if I missed anything. I probably didn't. I'm just recognizing. Hey, uh, just so I know, because I can't see every... There's so much chat here. Let me ask everybody here. Is there any crazy stuff going on in the chat right now? Is there anybody who's like triggered and they're just losing their mind and they're like in the chat arguing that I'm full of it or they're arguing with you right now about how this is like I'm all wrong and stuff? Have you been seeing that in the chat yet? Anybody? Yeah, a day to God is like a thousand years to us. That's what that's that one get out of jail free card that Christians love to use. <laughs> Because God doesn't mean soon, right? He doesn't really mean soon. You know, he meant soon to the angels. They speak God's language of time, not to the humans that are writing these pages to write to other humans so that humans would understand what they're trying to trying to say. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. And he's not the author of confusion. That's what, yeah. Yeah, that there you have it. He's not the author of confusion. There you go, right? Because God was speaking in a language that he knew what he was saying and he knew what he meant, but he knew that humans wouldn't know what he meant. God, you're funny. God, you're super funny. Hmm. You know, people have been killing people over this stuff for a long time, but psh, you're God, you know, you can't do no wrong. <laughs> anyway, who, Derek? Good evening. You sound like Dr. Gene Kim from Real Bible Believers. Hallelujah. You know, maybe maybe Dr. Gene Kim sounds like me. You ever thought about that one, my friend? Good to see you, Spike Ez. Thank you. Holy freaking smokes. Humanist Reformation, you're a god. Everybody, hell, humanist Reformation. Right now, you will be seated on my right hand. Okay, which still could mean you're a God, like like the weird, strange ideas of like multiple powers in heaven that Jews also had in the first century. Jesus could be seated at the right hand of God and be considered a God, actually, but just not the same exact identical. He wasn't Yahweh, um, but you are definitely seated at the right hand for this big super chat, my friend. Jesus lied. Jesus lied. Oh, Jesus lied. Don't take my word. Derek's word or your pastor's word for it. Take it from the words of the self-proclaimed son of God's own mouth in the divine word of God. Keep preaching the obvious verifiable truth, Derek. Thanks. <laughs> yes, it's right there. It's right there. And Christian scholars see it. C.S. Lewis, I almost called him Leus. I don't know why. C.S. Lewis saw it. C.S. Lewis was like, yo, uh, yeah, Jesus got this one wrong. He was puffing that pipe and he knew. He was like, damn, you know, Jesus, you shouldn't have said that, man. Why, why'd you have to do that? But not only that, Del C. Allison Jr., and he doesn't like feel bad about it. He just goes, yeah, no, the old apocalyptic, you know, preaching and, and it, it didn't happen. That It didn't happen. Now, he believes for a totally different reason. So I'm, I'm hoping I can give Christians reasons for either considering that they don't need this or realizing like they had to have had some profound experience that causes them to draw the conclusions that they draw. But Hindus do the same. Buddhists do the same. Everybody does the same. Muslims, you name it. What makes yours true and theirs wrong? Thank you so much for that enormous super chat. Seriously. Like your sins, past, present, and future. Pretty much what I'm saying is go and sin. Don't worry, my friend. They're forgiven. <laughs> for real, though. For real. We aren't worthy. OG Skywatch is right. We really, I mean, the fact that you're here, I'm not even supposed to loosen your sandals. And you're asking me to say these words. It should be you, O oh Master. But... If it's to fulfill scripture and you're asking me to do so, I will. 
Well, Derek, all you need is fourteen hundred more dollars in your in your in Seattle. <laughs> Ray, seriously, you're right. Seattle's expensive too. C.S. Lias. That's probably why I was saying that. Maybe I was trying to say that. I don't know. I will. I'm actually growing your hair out for this very, my hair out for this very reason. I have an alabaster jar of sweet anointment right here. And uh, that is not a pagan God symbol on the front of the cover at all of uh, Starbucks. So um, we're monotheist here. Duh. And uh, yeah, in this alabaster jar of ointment, I'm going to grow my long, beautiful, sexy, blonde hair, and I'm going to massage it into, into the feet of one worthy. One worthy. I bet you'll never guess who that person is. Never. You'll never guess. I, I dare you to try. You'll never guess who's worthy for me to put the alabaster ointment on their feet. Psh. Even if it's right in front of you, you'll never know. Just like the New Testament for some Christians. Jesus can say soon, near, this generation, about to happen. The night is far spent. The salvation is about to approach. We who are alive and remain in this coming. Uh, don't close the seal, the scroll. Don't. I'm about to come. Behold, I come quickly. Uh, you know, right in front of their nose. They don't even see it. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I'm just lurking here from Scotland to win Derek back to Calvinism. Callan, you know, you've got balls. Serious ones. To come in here in the lion's den like that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm glad you're in the chat. I always enjoy everybody. I'm, I'm seriously, I, I appreciate it. You were predestined to be here, though. I know that for a fact. Abel, have you studied or read about Bible codes? Maybe look into it, too. As people... We should look into everything, and God, if there is one, should be okay. That's true. If there is a God, like, you would think that it would be okay with what? You know how they say, uh, I shake in what my mama gave me or whatever. Like, well, if we're created and made and we didn't choose what we are, it should be okay with how we are as creatures on this earth too, but and not blame us for the way we come naturally into the world. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, but the Bible code thing, I, I'm, I'm very cautious on all of that stuff, Abel. But I'm not saying I, I wouldn't look into it. I'd look into it to probably see if there was like gematria or weird numerology and stuff because Jews definitely did some funny, funny stuff with their literature. And they would like read things into it. The rabbis did this a lot. They found things in the text that weren't there, you know, but they would look, they would, they would find it. Uh, what they call that? Uh, I'm telling you, the, the sun has fried my head today because usually I'd be like this. They call that midrash. They call that, uh, I call it recontextualization for your own needs. Just reapply the text. But as far as codes and secret words and like twin towers and all that kind of stuff or prophesied and here, I don't buy into all of that, Abel. I have looked into some of that stuff but I wouldn't have time to go into all of it, breaking down all of that. I wouldn't mind doing it with a scholar though, at some point, like what's going on here. But uh, thank you again for the support. I, I want to say one thing too, Abel. I don't want you to get that. I'm just a cynical person, but I am quite cynical at times. Um, I do appreciate your support. And while I may disagree with some of the things you say, I, I always love having these conversations. So thank you so much. Really. <laughs> Calvin gives me nightmares. <laughs> Uh, isn't it all predestined? It is. Oh, my snap diggity dog. What can I do? What can I do? I mean, can we say, like, can we add you to, like, a rosary or something and, like, have humanist reformation there? Like, can I build a shrine? Can we all build a tabernacle, actually? That's the right words. Because right now I'm blinded by your light, and there's a voice that's saying, you know, Behold, my beloved skeptic, in whom I am well pleased. Can, can we build a tabernacle here? Me and the 276 people watching right now? Anyway, seriously, thank you. Second Peter was talking to the first century Christians on the one day is a thousand P 
Peter promises, Jesus would keep his promises just a little after that. People back then were leaving the early church as Jesus did not return his promise from his own mouth. Now that is a passage we need to open. That is one that I don't even know what else to tell you. Second Peter 3, actually we might as well go to the beginning of Second Peter. Well, 2 Peter, let's do this, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3. We'll go to the chapter one. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received faith as a precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, Bart Ehrman, in his book Forged and Counterforgery, tears this one a new bunghole, okay? Like, it really shows you that this is not Peter. I'm convinced... Um, secular humanist, I'm convinced that this is actually about, oh, you guys can't see my screen. I'm convinced that this is about, this is second century, I would think. I'm convinced this is late in the game. Probably the latest text in the New Testament, I think, is Second Peter. Might even be in the middle of the second century, like 150s. Eusebius didn't even think this was Peter. But what gets me is this passage right here. I'm going to zoom in for those who don't have sight. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. Lie. That's what you know. scholars will point out. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. So this is going to be a command from Jesus and the apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come. Now, you wouldn't say this if there weren't people scoffing. And they're scoffing, and they are like, yo, what the heck? Scoffing and following their own evil desires. Remember, the whole New Testament says they're living in the net in the last days. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord... <laughs> A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. You can tell me that's not the biggest cop-out. Now, mind you, we're going back up here to the scoffers. Jesus said this generation will not pass away. It seems that they all thought it was going to happen very soon. Now, when it hasn't happened, when you say it's going to happen, like if I told you all, all right, let me, let me pop myself back up here on the screen. If I told you all that I'm going to be a billionaire in 10 years and wait till you see it, I'm not only going to be a billionaire to all of you who doubt me, who don't believe in me, possibly worship me. I'm going to kick your butts. Yeah, that's right. And I have some followers that I've relayed this message to. And some of these followers, you know, be going around telling people, hey, he's coming in 10 years. He's going to have a billion dollars. You're going to kick your butt. And 12 years passes. All right. The time in which I say I'm going to do it, there's going to be some mocking happening. They're going to be like, dude, where is this coming? Where is this billion dollars? You said you were going to do these things. Man, you're full of it. You didn't do those things. That's exactly what Second Peter is doing here. Going back to Second Peter, literally is saying the scoffing and they're following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Now, you wouldn't say that if it isn't already past the time that he's saying he's going to come. Like, if you're late, well, hold on. Where, where is this long coming, right? Ever since our ancestors died, the scoffers are saying, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. You guys say the end of the world's coming and all this stuff's supposed to happen. Where is this coming? Nothing's happening. And then, of course, the evangelist here, wants to add, but they deliberately forget that long ago, <laughs> let's get out of this one. 
Okay. A day is like a thousand years with the Lord. A thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slack or slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, well, why isn't he coming? Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So the reason Jesus didn't keep his promise on coming in the time that he said these things were going to happen and that the end was going to come and the son of man and the whole nine and that Paul was saying all this stuff's going to happen and the book of Revelation says it's all going to happen. Well, it's because he's trying to save more people. So God, while Paul's saying, look, he's shortening the time, these guys are saying, eh, what time? There is no time. There's no time. We can't make sense of this anymore. That's the kind of Christianity that you dive into in 2 Peter. Can I get an amen in the chat? Can I get an amen? Thank you again for showering me with your godly blessings. I, I, I feel like an apotheosis is literally going to happen before you die. You're going to ascend on high. It's just we're all going to witness it like Romulus. And I hope you come back to at least have some eyewitnesses clarify your deification to know that you're the true the true one we should be worshiping. What is going on, my friends? Is my sarcasm bleeding through? I hope so. I would rather burn in hell. You know, I almost put that on the thumbnail just for the just to be funny. I'm going to burn in hell. That's what I was going to put on the thumbnail. Just, you know, why not? I mean, many Christians think it. I'm just going to like, it doesn't offend me. It really doesn't. What hurts my feelings is when my mom really believes it. And she, and I mean, this is me not being sarcastic. I'm being serious now. When my mom really believes it and my mom is talking to me and she's afraid, she's scared that I'm actually going to suffer and things like that. And I'm like, mom, it's an abusive relationship that that, that, that kind of mindset of God is like, that's an abusive relationship. It really is. That is what triggers or upsets me. And it, and it really makes me even want to do this more so that more people will wake up and that more people will realize they are great people. They're not wicked, evil, vile creatures, that their good deeds are rags with filth. Come on. No, you're amazing the way you are and who you are. And we can always do better. We can aspire to being better. But no, that's a horrible outlook on oneself, you know? Abel Chavez says reincarnation would fix and be rightful judgment. <laughs> I haven't studied reincarnation enough, Abel. You probably know a lot more than I do. I'm getting the amen in the chat. That's a good thing. Omen, amen, 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 amen. Oh, godless blessings on us all. Praise God we are, amen. Uh, I'm amen. <laughs> Amin Ra, Amin Yel. I just, I, I made the Amin Yel, but anyway, Emmanuel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, I'm scrolling down. Did we catch up? I do. I need to check out reincarnation. I will. All right. Now we're caught up. Amon, Hyman, Hyman. All right. Let's go ahead and get it. Let's get back to this here. I don't want to go there. I want to go back to the pericope. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things about to come, now once at the summonation, summonation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin. So they're thinking, this is it, man. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, as you see the day drawing near, the fury of, of a fire which is about to consume the adversaries. That sounds nice. Barbecue for your enemies. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Didn't we just read in 2 Peter 3? Here we are in 2 Peter 3 again. So some people are like, man, why is he delaying? What's the deal with Jesus, this guy Jesus? You know, where is this coming? He he promised. He, he seems like he's delayed. I mean, ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on, you know, as it has since the beginning of creation. It sounds like Jesus is delaying. 
And then he's like, no, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. Chill out. Chill out. Look, the Lord is not delayed, slow in his keeping his promise. Okay. He says he's coming soon as some understand slowness. Instead, he's just being patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but, you know, everyone to come to repentance. You know, everyone but Judas, who was predestined to betray him and, you know, uh, the demons and the devils and Satan and his angels and, you know, uh, those that God hardened their hearts, you know, and, oh, well, Esau, God hated, you know, and Jacob I loved. And, you know, those, those other than those people, he wants everyone else to be, re you know, go to repentance. So, he, he, you know, he's trying, he's trying. And then you come right back to Hebrews. He who is coming will come and will not delay. But remember, a thousand years, you know, <laughs> what is a delay? If I told you all, listen, I'm going to do a live stream soon and I won't delay. Common sense language would tell you. And if I'm God, I would know even better how to convey it so humans understand it even more. And I am a human explaining to humans. Like you would think God would be able to make this understandable. Hmm. And I think he did. I'm trying to be funny. He made it very understandable. And it failed. For here, we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the one that is about to come. What city? Ah, I know what city. I know what city he's talking about. This one. A new heaven and new earth city. The one that he's saying is about to come. Don't, you know, still up the scroll in Revelation 21. Yeah, that city that's supposed to come with no more tears and no more death that didn't come, that's the city. That's the city. Speak and so act as those who are about to be judged by the law of liberty, James 2.12. Are they about to be judged? When, when are they about to be? When, when? Back in the first century, this is being written. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Thousands of years of patience. You too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Yes, finally, not coming. Salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, 1 Peter 1, 5. I mean, if you notice, I'll, I'm going to keep that highlighted so I know where I'm at. If you notice, almost every book in your New Testament, almost, is doing this. Like, almost every single book, the entire New Testament literally has a flavor of this running through it. And if this isn't true, and this fails, and it's wrong, what does that do to Christianity? Like, what does that do to the entire belief system of Christianity if this is wrong? If all of these people, when they expected these things to happen, didn't happen, which to me says they won't happen. Not that, oh, well, it didn't happen when, uh, we got to keep pushing the date off. That's cognitive dissonance. That's making up words that the New Testament does not teach. If it didn't happen, then it didn't happen and it's a failure, which means it won't happen, which means it's wrong, which means what does that do to Christianity? Make it wrong. And if it's wrong, why do we believe it? For the other things that we find in there that we pick to use for ourselves. In fact, Athanasius and Irenaeus, well, Irenaeus before Athanasius, but they used the book of Revelation. They didn't want to. They thought it was written by a heretic. They used it because one of their friends got killed. Irenaeus had a friend who got killed under the legal system. And he said that he was pretty much a martyr and thought, oh my gosh, look at how much martyrdom is in the book of Revelation. So he thought it was prophesying his day in the 180s. What the heck? He's talking about Nero. But he thought it was talking about his day because he found things in the text that he liked that related to his experience and said, oh, that's about us. Just like this guy right here that I've showed you a hundred times. It goes, the final part of the final last day part of the last hour. And he talked about pestilence. Why? Because COVID-19 is the reason this guy made this video. 
And because of his experience in these days, they find this text that says pestilence or earthquakes or famine or war or whatever. And they go, that's talking about us. And so they apply it to themselves. They never let go. He has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. They shall give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment and, and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Do, now, the question is, for real, do we need to be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer if the last things aren't at hand? It's a serious question. If it if that's wrong, that the that the end of all things is at hand, then must we be of this, the sober and judgment, sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer? Is that required? For it is time for judgment to begin within the household of God. For it is time for judgment to begin. They're ready for this to happen. As your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is about to be revealed. Hmm. He's hoping it's about to happen. We have the prophetic word, which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, in your hearts. Their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. In the last days, mockers and scoffers, we already read this. Oh, for this they willingly are ignorant of. This is 1 Peter. Oh, we just went through the 2 Peter one. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with a roar. I didn't hear anything. And the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? There's people like, they're trying to push the end days to happen. They think, let's get all the Jews to Israel. Let's do this. Let's force Palestinians out. Like there's all sorts of crap that goes on right now because of this end, end of days teaching. Harold Camping had people sell their houses thinking this is it to support his ministry. He was wrong. The darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The world is passing away and its desires. It is the last hour. Now, I don't know about you. I'm going to come back to check on y'all, make sure everybody's still alive over here in the chat. All right. I don't know about you, but when people say like, it is the last hour, like that makes absolutely no sense to then say, well, a day is like a thousand years. Unless you're trying to get out of a tough one. And that's exactly what I think is happening. These authors are trying to tell their audience something and their audience knows exactly what they're trying to say. And they believe it is the last hour. But time isn't time. So the author who's saying it's the last hour, like, no, I mean, that doesn't mean it's soon. An hour could be a thousand years too. Remember now a thousand years, it could be 2000 years, it could be 4,000 years. So when it says, and we're in the last hour, be ready to the people he's writing to really, what the heck does that even mean? All right. Let me make sure everybody in here is alive and well in the chizzy. Baron says, thank you for the stream, Derek. I'm scrolling up from there. Derek, are you confused? No worries. Soon earth be in the center of the universe. Beast four is about to arrive. It's the la it's not the last hour yet. Jesus, man. It's not. First John begs to differ. The New Testament tells us a different story. What do I do? What do I do? <laughs> Look, I don't know what to do. I mean, I just keep repeating it. I guess when you repeat the thing, like it, it starts to become, you know, clear to some. 
I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I should speak in tongues. I think they would understand that language better than they would like clear language. In the last days, Derek's chat will be imploded. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, you're going into that. Okay. I see what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we're getting close to entering into, um, not Pisces. Pisces was the age of Jesus uh, or the Christian church. So we're entering the age of Aquarius. Uh, I guess it's going to be the cyclical nonstop. That doesn't sound like that's what they're doing. That does not sound at all like what they're doing. Uh, like, oh, but there's another age after this. Don't worry. The end isn't completely done. And no, it, it sounds like there's no more death, no more tears. The new heavens and new earth is going to come down out of heaven. It is very apocalyptic, and they really think this is going to happen. Nick, my friend, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to hex you for this statement. I hope that uh, you don't mind, you know. I hope you don't mind. I just hexed you in my brain. I think you felt that. You felt that. I know you did. When a person dies, they go to the Lord. Thus, the coming of the Lord is instant for them. This guy is illiterate about eschatology. Nick, 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 Nick. You know what? That's interesting because the Lord said he's coming. What the heck is the coming of the Lord when you're coming to him? That makes absolutely no damn sense. If you're going to die and go to him then he needs to stop saying he's going to come to them. Paul expects him to come in the sky. Illiterate, my friend, look in the mirror. You might want to reevaluate yourself and consider that while reading the New Testament. But I get why you're saying that because it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? So pff, we ought to just die because then we just be present with the Lord. Like, no, there are clear apocalypticism, my friend. You should read apocalyptic literature and not just the New Testament to come to these conclusions. Read Dead Sea Scroll literature. Read Habakkuk Pesher, for example, to find out that they also predicted the Danielic prophecies and got it wrong. The New Testament is doing the same thing. My friend, the only person I think that's mistaken here is you, honestly. I would do some reevaluation of your eschatology, but then again, you're probably a pre-mill, post-mill, mid-trib, post-trib, uh, partial preterist, post-millennialist, amillennialist, who knows? You might you might be one of those. You might even be a full preterist for all I know. Either way, somehow cognitive dissonance is going to work in and nothing I say or the New Testament says will fix it. Maybe my hex might fix it. I don't know. Maybe my hex might fix it. Robert says, I'm late. Could you start over, please? <laughs> you know what? Yeah, let's start over. Okay, not 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 gonna happen. You're gonna have to start over. And when you do, you'll notice that I'm like deaf for like three minutes because I muted myself and I thought I was talking. No, no good. No good. All right, let's get back into these texts here. I'm about to show you the text. All right, it is the last hour. Except this guy doesn't think it's the last hour. Where is he at? Nick, where you at, man? All right, I can't find you, dude. You're so buried under all the comments. You're the you're the only person who doesn't think it's the last hour, I guess. You think that Jesus, you're going to Jesus. Jesus isn't coming again. You're going to him. All right, that's amazing. I, I love that one. Even now, many antichrists have arisen. From this, we know that it is the last hour. Hmm. This is that of the Antichrist of which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. Who knows who they're comparing that to or who they are? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. About these also Enoch prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly. This also shows in Jude, he's quoting from the book One Enoch, which is scripture according to this guy, but not according to Christians today and probably not according to Nick. 
But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause divisions. To show his bond servants the things which must shortly take place. The whole book of Revelation opens and closes with, this is what I'm going to show you, the whole book of Revelation, according to the Apocalypse of John, of what must shortly take place. That's the first freaking verse in that book. Literally, the first book in Revelation is saying, everything you're about to read must shortly take place. And then at the outset, we're going to get to that. You're going to come back to that. Revelation 1.3, the time is near that all the things written in the book of Revelation that he's going to go into, all this stuff must shortly take place. The time is near. The book tells you this. Illiterate is those who ignore what the book is saying right here. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Well, unless we go to him, <laughs> you know, I guess until I come. Jesus isn't coming to us. Some people think we're going to him. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, which is about to come upon the whole world. Revelation 3.10. I am coming quickly. And I hope he doesn't mean that in any sexual sense. Revelation 3.11. And she gave birth to a son, a male son, who is about to rule the nations with the rod of iron. You know, this author was waiting for Rome to get their butt kicked. And in her, the great city Babylon was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. Revelation 18, 24. Compare Matthew 23, Luke 11. But I also find it interesting. This, this author has Rome in mind for sure. To show his bond servants things which must shortly take place. Here we go again. Remember, Revelation 1, 1 things which must shortly take place. The closing of this book, Revelation 22, 6, the things which must shortly take place, the whole book is supposed to happen soon. Behold, I am coming quickly. Actually, Nick, uh, if Nick's still in the chat, this text, Nick wants this text to say, behold, we are coming quickly to the Lord. Amen. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Behold, I am coming quickly. Can you say it enough? I mean, behold, we're coming quickly to you, Lord. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, yes, I am coming quickly. Revelation 22, 20. Hallelujah. That, that's like, that could be interpreted so bad. Oh, yes, I'm coming quickly. You got to admit that that, <laughs> that came out pretty, pretty wrong, right? I think so. That that came out pretty bad. All right, I'm scrolling up. Nick, where you at, man? I'm going to apologize for telling you how wrong you are. Where you at? Come on, Nick. Let's make up. Where you at, man? Nick, don't leave. Come on. I didn't really hex you, bro. Where you at? Ugh. All right, I'm going to get this super chat. Nick, if you're there and you're hiding and you know what I'm saying is true, but you just don't want to come out, I won't blame you, but I won't pick on you anymore either. Callan M, thank you for the super chat. Derek, Myth Vision needs to become King James Version Bible only. Old archaic English is so respectful to God. Stop your NIV ESV heresy. You're right. The first Bible I ever owned like that I read from beginning to end, probably owned, I probably owned Bibles before that. This Bible right here is the first Bible that I read from Genesis to Revelation. And I mean, I just, I was just gone in this book. I, I had all those, you know, look at this one. Shut up devil for it is written. I probably blow myself away before you were saved. Your spirit was dead. The more light you walk in, the more light you receive. These are little notes that I put. Start memorizing scriptures. Anyway, just to show you all, like, I don't know. You can even see the colors and stuff, but 
I would go through and try to like get into all these different passages and I'd like be in the story at the time and get really, really stuck into it. And it clumps. This is the old, old Bible. I told my kids that when they, when I'm long gone and dead, keep it around, you know, show pass this on. This is King James only. It doesn't say that it just says it's King James, but I was a King James only when I read this Bible. KJV giant print personal size reference Zondervan. So yeah, I, um, I've been committing heresy lately and I got to get back on track. You're right. Thank you for that super chat, my friend, Nick, where are you at? Nick, where are you at? Nick, come on, my friend, Derek, there are no lions. So don't think it. What lions? What secret you want to know? I want you to tell me what I ate for lunch. If you know that, then you have the power. Yes, he was just a man. Absolutely. All right, I just wanted to make sure you I didn't leave y'all hanging out. We just went through those pericope. Oh, I, I'm, I'm teasing second nature. I definitely know that Nick is just, he could point out maybe a few passages in the Bible where it talks about when you die, you'll be in the presence of God or, you, you know, that uh, once to die, then the judgment or something like that. Um, and there are Christians who actually start to change that because the apocalyptic failure, I'm looking at it, excuse me, I'm looking at that apocalyptic failure and I'm thinking to myself, like, it's clear that they've made it into something since it's not going to happen here. It, it's going to happen when they die. So now they start to make it about heaven and they focus on going to heaven rather than fixing earth and God coming down to earth and bringing his kingdom here on earth. It becomes something that's like stored up treasures in heaven somewhere else. Like it's not something that actually is going to uh, be fixed here. But then again, there's the idea that heaven comes down to earth. So the new Jerusalem is supposed to come down out of heaven. There's so many things. So many things. Temi, thank you for that super chat. Seriously. I really appreciate it. Try again, Islam Channel USA. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to get you to guess what I ate for lunch, but <laughs> All right. Well, with that being said, listen, I've done quite a long three hour and 10 minute uh, discussion on clear, clear, it should have happened type of passages. So I feel like if I could be a shameless plug just for the sake of being a shameless plug, please consider the Patreon. I've got videos. I want to brag Jesus versus Caesar, John Dominic Crossan. Like I just launched that one. Um, we did that one. This one's the Mark of the Beast we got into with John Dominic Cross, and he explains that really well. There's a lot of videos that I haven't made public that are on there. And when you get to the bottom, you can actually hit load more if it'll do it. I'll be shocked if it does while we're on the show because it usually takes a while to upload. We'll check on it in just a second. But yeah, I've got a lot of videos. This one's really fun. In fact, who in the chat right now I'm, I'm watching your chat. Who in the chat wants to see the beginning tease of an upcoming video that I did with, um, oh, I can't even think. Forgive me here. Hold on. Where's it at? What the heck? Oh, Jesus and God. Does the New Testament really teach is Jesus God with James F. McGrath? It's on Patreon. Who wants to see it? Who wants to see the tease at the beginning? This is on my Patreon. I do I do want to get some people to support, keep it growing so I can keep doing what I'm doing. It's still loading. You see that? I can't do it while I'm doing the show. All right, I'm going to show you and tease that. Let me pop this up. I think everybody's going to enjoy this little tease here. I made a, a clever little intro, and I think it's good. Hold on. Here we go. Getting it, getting it. Okay. 
da. All right, here we go. Now I got it. James F. McGrath, for those who don't know, is like a legit world-class scholar. When James, D uh, is it James Dunn? James Dunn died. He like filled his shoes. So he's like a legit exegetical scholar. This is first look for those who have been so kind to stick it out so long. This is the opening of this video that you can access right now. You can join Patreon for $3 a month, literally, and get the whole year at 16% off. If you believe in what I'm doing, it's worth it, and you have access to so much, and you can talk to me in private, all of that. Here we go. Does the New Testament teach Trinitarianism? No. 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 You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Warning to those who are triggered easily because of heretical or scholarly ideas. You may not want to continue past this point. Jesus and God, are they the same? Are they equal? Or is one subordinate? Is our understanding of monotheism a bit anachronistic, or have we been influenced by particular versions of monotheism that don't allow for weird ideas to be the case? Dr. James F. McGrath is joining me today here on Myth Vision for the first time. I don't know what happened at the beginning of this video with my video quality, but it gets better throughout the episode. You're not going to want to miss this because it gets into Christology. Was Jesus God? Did he become divine? And if so, what does it mean to have multiple powers in heaven subordinate to a father? Is the Trinity true? Does the Bible really teach that? Well, just by saying that intro, you're automatically a heretic. Huh, maybe I like being one. Let me know what you think of the show. Drop a like, comment, and don't forget to join Myth Vision's Patreon to help us out. Join the community. We Look at how crappy my video is. You can tell the internet sucked when I recorded it for whatever reason. And he saw that it sucked, but he didn't think anything of it. I don't know why he didn't tell me that earlier. What did y'all think about that little teaser for the opening? I'm looking for the chat, so let me know. What do you think? While you do that, I'm going to close some of this stuff to make sure my computer isn't bogging down. Very teasy, nice D, thumbs up. Oh, hold on, I got a call coming in, hold on. Hey, Christopher, I'm on a, I'm on a live right now. You want me to call you right back? Uh, yeah, how long? Uh, 10 minutes maybe, Max, something for? Okay, okay. Okay, 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 bye. So... That this guy works with Bart Ehrman. I just got a call from a gentleman who works with Bart Ehrman. I'm sure it's important because he said it's good news. Give me a call back. Okay, I love those calls. Someone said five stars. Hallelujah. You're going to heaven, Logan. Teasy peasy. Heaven for you too. Need more cowbell. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm going to start working on that because I think it would have drawn more people to want to become Patreon members if I did have that. Yeah. Derek will know if he asked where to look. He, he, he. Uh, Jesus died to keep us out of hell. Why would go there at all? Why we go would go there at all? Good point. It makes no sense. All Jack Nicholson is welcomed. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's a good compliment. Um, yes, Jesus did punish me, but I beat him halfway through the uh, interview. I defeated um, Jesus's powers on trying to keep me from having good quality. You'll find that out. Good question for the teaser. We all like a good tease from time to time. It's what my wife and I say to each other from time to time. You know, uh, Nice teaser. Uh, Tice or Tice here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome content. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Jesus lied. He will be judged for his lies too. Ooh. Ooh. I don't go too far. I mean, he's been judged by us now at this point for saying he's wrong. Gonna be mind blowing for sure. Absolutely, it's on the Patreon right now. It is on the Patreon. It yeah, it could be from it could be from Vishnu, but yes, please, please, if you do love what I'm doing, I really mean this. 
please join the Patreon. Um, you'll be part of the community. You help me do what I do. And if you're interested in also checking out Bart Ehrman's new course, he's got the gospel courses right now, and he's got the early bird special. And uh, come on out, man. You're good. Uh, my contractor's here. He's, I call him my contractor. He's my friend. What is? Oh, you like it? Yeah? I'll be in in just a second. I'm going to go change. I'll be right back. Okay, brother. Thank you. Um, my contractor's impressed with uh, the uh, work that I've done on the countertops in the kitchen. He, he just told me that I'm not going to hell. In fact, I earned my way into heaven with hard work. Yeah, work salvation. It's really tough. I know, I know. I got to go in there in a second. But yeah, consider checking out um, the courses. I'm going to pin a comment after this live with the courses, the latest, greatest on the unknown gospels that Bart Ehrman's doing. I can't wait to get into this. Is he picks apart the contradictions. Remember, Bart Ehrman is a is a critical, um, a textual critic. He's not just a critical scholar. He's a textual critic. He sees the Greek and the source materials and the various sources that are out there and what's said in this and not in that and Sinaiticus and the Tectus Receptus, the whole nine. Like this guy's looking at the text and he's seeing, whoa, we have problems here. And people don't know how to read these gospels. They they're reading them like we're told in church. All the gospels tell one story, one gospel, one message. It's all true and they're all saying the same thing. No, they're not. So go myth vision. Here, putting it on the screen. That's what I did last time. It made it easier. Go to mythvisionpodcast.com forward slash unknown gospels. Get that early bird special. It's going to be live. You can harass him with your critical scholarly questions because Myth Vision brings the best audience. We have the best questions. We ask the best questions. We we dive deep because we're into that crazy, hardcore, critical thinking material. I mean, we have like all of the academics out here on the channel. You can't come to Myth Vision and not get scholarship. That's just the way we, that's the cookie crumbles that way. That's it. it is what it is. So there's that. Patreon, grow wings, come in here and harass me. Talk about what kind of food you like. You can private message me. I don't care. But ultimately, you'll access all material that I edit and put out early. And you keep me doing this full time. That's enough about me. Any other statements or questions from the audience before I end up uh, ascending and having an apotheosis? No, these are um, these are courses that Bart is selling to the lay folk. Like he already teaches college courses and stuff. So this is for common people. He wants like people who aren't in. Well, there are scholars who watch his stuff too, but it's like too many people don't really know how to read the Gospels. And if you're already a scholar, you're already aware of how academics parse the Gospels and look at this literature. So really, it's it's to get more people who don't understand it to do that. See, hitting the early bird special. Behold, Jesus comes quickly. <laughs> Amen. Myth Vision is a new, unique community bringing it all together. That's right. We do. And I even talk to scholars who are Christians. It's, it's, they know I'm a skeptic. They get it. But it is what it is. Riley says, sounds like you are all dead. <laughs> Darlene says, compelling opening grabs the attention. Thank you so much. Ethan, definitely, you're absolutely right about that. Derek, we all hope you're having a good time. Are you common people? Yeah, people who aren't academics. That's all I mean. That's right, elitist. <laughs> all right, well, I'm going to go and make sure my marriage is still intact. Make sure that my contractor's really happy with the work that I did. And uh, I really, really appreciate everybody. All the love, all the support, all the super chats for being there in the tough times. All of you who are here, I really seriously appreciate you. Go down in the description. If you're watching this live or if you're watching this later, help the community out. Join the Patreon. Check out the early bird access and go and check out this course. I do get a commission for those who sign up. So in that way, you're getting something and you're helping Myth Vision. And also, if you join the Patreon, like 
automatic get out of hell free card. Like you're not going to hell. That's for those who don't want to join it and they're stubborn, you know, because I love them so much. You know, I love them so much that I have to punish them if they don't join my Patreon. It's simple. It's really simple. And um, we are Myth Vision. Love y'all.